ICA welcomes you to this event and thanks you for your participation. To improve the quality of the video conference, please take note of the following recommendations. Remember to unmute your microphone only when you are given the floor. Please keep your microphone muted when another person is speaking. We ask that you keep your camera on at all times so that the other participants can see you. If you need to step away for a moment, you can turn the camera off and turn it back on when you return. Please put your cell phone in silent mode to avoid any interruptions during the video conference. We recommend that you maintain proper posture and position yourself adequately in front of your computer. Simultaneous interpretation will be provided for this meeting via the Zoom platform. At the bottom of the Zoom screen, you will see a globe icon that says Interpretation. Click the icon and select the language you wish to listen to. It is very important that you select the language in which you will speak as this will facilitate the interpretation. At the end of the video, please remain silent for 30 seconds. Afterwards, the moderator will begin the meeting. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, everyone. Um, welcome. Uh, my name is Tim Widmer and I am the acting committee chair for the Plant Health Task Force. And along uh, with the other committee members, uh, Jose Lopez Oroyo and Sergio Paulo, uh, we would like to welcome you uh, to the ProSonorte Plant Health Task Force workshop for 2021. This year, we have two uh, exciting topics, uh, herbicide resistance and invasive insect pests uh, that are a concern uh, for all of our countries. And we will hear from top experts today from each of the three countries, Canada, Mexico, and the United States. Uh, this morning, uh, we will start out uh, with the invasive insect pests, uh, take a short 20 minute break, uh, and then finish up this afternoon with herbicide resistance. Um, after each speaker, we will have time for questions. Uh, so please uh, type your questions into the Q&A um, as you see um, here. Um, that is shown now on the screen um, in Zoom. Um, and so now uh, it is my um, great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. John Charles Vallet, uh, who is the Executive Secretariat uh, for ProSonorte. John Charles. Hey, thanks, Tim. Welcome, everybody, uh, to this uh, very exciting ProSonorte webinar on emerging issues in pest management. Uh, it's part of our ProSonorte work. Prosonorti falls under ICA. So ICA is the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation on Agriculture. It's headquartered in Costa Rica. We have 35 offices across all of the Americas and one in Spain. So we are the head of the Canadian office here in Ottawa. And we're also the executive secretariat of Prosonorti. And ICA has a tremendous amount of technical cooperation mechanisms, one of them of which is the one for the Northern and we call it ProSinorte. It's the cooperative pro program in research and technology for the northern region. Uh, it's basically a trilateral network of federal, agricultural, public, agri-food, and food system research bodies in Canada, the US, and Mexico. It aims to promote cooperation in research and technology in the northern region through exchanges, through research collaborations, through partnerships, and to make really the sector, if we can, through research, more competitive and more sustainable, foster additional agriculture development by incorporating science, by incorporating technology, innovation, and knowledge sharing, then areas really of trilateral relevance across all of these three countries. We also work in the Caribbean a little. Plant health is really important. As an agronomist, um, my PhD is in geography, but I did study plant uh, science when I was an agronomist. And really discovered that you know healthy plants are vital, and we can't really achieve all of the UN SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, if we don't have strong, healthy plants. And so your work, your research as scientists, research, you know, those in industry, those in government, your work is very important 
for the quality of the plant, for the health of the plant. So it helps our food supply, their source of foods, fiber and um, fuel. Um, we can, with their advances in, in breeding and genetics. And it really allows farmers to grow crops in various varieties that are healthier, that are more resilient. It's a very hot topic today now with the, on climate change, the resilience, resilience to drought, to losses, including pests and diseases, which is the topic of today's workshop. So my thanks to Tim, to the task force members, to Costa Norte, our internal logistics team, Gloria and Isabel, translators in Costa Rica, and support from Mika. And welcome all of you to our very exciting today's session. Today is open to the public. Tomorrow will be for our researchers within the network. I wish you much success and thanks for coming today. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Jean-Charles. Um, and, uh, you know, like you said, um, plant health is very important. And one thing we've realized during this pandemic is uh, that there's very similar to plant health as is to human health. Plants get sick also. Um, and so it is a very important topic. Uh, and, um, and now um, we're, we're a little early on our agenda, but that's okay because that will leave more time for questions and answers. Again, please put your questions uh, into the Q&A box. Uh, and at this time now, um, I'm going to uh, turn over uh, the, to uh, Sergio Paulo, um, who is the um, moderator uh, for uh, the invasive insect pest sessions. Uh, and uh, Sergio, I will let you um, introduce yourself a little bit uh, and um, then we can uh, start our talks. So um, thank you. Hello, this is Jose Isabel Lopez Arroyo. I am a, a Mexican researcher. I work at INIFAP. And well, I'm, on, I'm going to conduct the morning session. Uh, Sergio Paulo is going to, to moderate the herbicide section. Uh, I'm very glad to be here with all of you. I hope that we can have an excitement, excitement moment with the information that we are going to receive during this day. Uh, I am in the north of Mexico and I salute all of you, wherever you are. Hope you are enjoying this, se this session. For our morning session, the third speaker is Dr. Sergio Sanchez Peña. Dr. Sanchez Peña is a professor at Universidad Autónoma Agraria Antonio Narro in Saltillo, Coahuila, Mexico, in the north of Mexico. He teaches biological control and integrated pest management. He's interested in invasive species. His works include research in Bagrada bug, yellow sugar cane aphid, Asian citrus psyllid, and potato psyllid. He is a specialist in entomopathogenic fungi. And for today, he's going to present uh, his research in Bagrada Bug in Mexico. Sergio Sanchez, please go ahead. Um, good morning. I think we are a little early, that's all right. Um, so we are we are uh, attaching to the uh, agenda, right? So I have 20 minutes <laughs> and Dr. Arroyo. Hello. You're correct, Sergio. Go ahead, please. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, I'm gonna talk about uh, uh, the Bagrada bug, like uh, Dr. Arroyo said, it's a, a very destructive destructive pest uh, that has invaded North America in recent years. This I'm going to talk a lot about the work of two of my uh, doctoral students, Reina Yvonne Torres Acosta and Moises Felipe, which is also now with INIFAP. So a lot of the information here comes from their dissertations. This is a, a very photogenic insect. You can see it here. It is usually found in copulation in the field. Sergio, uh, share, yes. share, share your... Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, 
now? We can see it. Okay, very good. Usa, usa, usa el, lo de presentación abajo. Gracias. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. Can you see it now? Yes. Thank okay. you. Okay, so this is a, a, an invasive pest. It's originary from the old world. Uh, I was showing photographs of these things in, in Spanish. The name Chinche Pintada has been used. Uh, so it is a native of the old world. And um, I'm just trying to collapse this panel, the side panel. Um, and it arrived in North America in 2008, in, in California more specifically. And uh, from there it is spread eastward until uh, it reached uh, Mexico. We detected it in, in Mexico in, in 2013. So from, North, from California in 2008, it made it to uh, Northern Mexico 2013. We made the, the first report of the insect in the country. And, and by 2017, it was spread all over, all over uh, North and Central Mexico, and it remains there to this day. Uh, the US uh, released uh, alerts because of the importance of this uh, invasive. Uh, it has caused agricultural problems everywhere. It is any, everywhere that is present. Now it's arrived in South America too, by the way, it's invaded Chile. And, and, and this year, Last year, no, this year or last year was detected in Argentina as well. So it is a major pest of brassica crops uh, throughout its range. Uh, it impacts, uh, this, this slide has some of the impacts. Uh, it caused in the early years of the invasion, it caused uh, up to 60% of, of seedling mortality in some fields. Um, so this, this list more impacts. Uh, up to 80% of the broccoli area was infested in California. So it, the impact was quite severe in, in, the, in the first uh, half of last decade. In, in Saltillo and in Sonora, the impact was also severe. Uh, although Saltillo is not a large uh, cruciferous uh, growing area, but Sonora is, and there, uh, there was quite a bit of destruction, uh, like I say, in the first half of the last decade, 2014, 2015. So what's the, the scenario in Saltillo? Uh, you know, I'm gonna talk about it because that's where we conducted our field observations. It's a semi-arid region. We have a lot of uh, alternate hosts of this insect. So the population has fluctuated over the years, up and down, up and down. Uh, and the damage to cultivated crops in, is very severe in the summer, particularly. So it is a, it's a prolific insect. It attacks not only crucifers, but it can also cause significant damage. We have seen it to corn, for example, and other crops, to maize. So what is the damage that this insect causes? Uh, well, I'm going to go fast through this because I have a lot of slides. So, but this is the, it's a piercing, sucking insect. So it causes uh, chlorosis and necrosis of the tissue with whitish lesions. It can kill the growing point. So it causes multiple heads of cabbage from destruction of the growing point. So these are more images of the damage, the chlorotic and necrotic areas on plants. So if populations are unchecked, they can, it's a very prolific insect. So the, the populations can be really high. This picture was taken in, in Saltillo in non-sprayed non -sprayed plots. So what is the importance of uh, the potential impact of this insect? Well, uh, brassic, brassica production in Mexico is, is quite important in, um, Okay, hold on, let me move this. Oh, <laughs> I cannot collapse the... So the, the, the production value in that year that I cannot see the year was about uh, 
50 millions of dollars in 2011. So they, this has prompted authorities to release uh, documents and alerts. This is a document from the Guanajuato, the state of Guanajuato government warning of the, of the insect. These are production data for Guanajuato also. And uh, it lists the counties and the production level. So in summary, summarizing this information, the value of brassica crops in Guanajuato in 2000, and just for one state, just one, well, the most important or the second most important in Mexico was about 120 million uh 120 million dollars so for the country we are talking of a figure probably close to 200 million dollars currently for the value of crucifers in in mexico incidentally we or, well reina ivon observed this insect feeding on moringa also which is a popular alternative medicine crop now this insect is sometimes confused with a North American native, the harlequin bug, and I'm going to mention it because I'll mention it further down the talk. So the objective in, in Reina's dissertation, the, object, the ob objectives were mainly four, to identify the weed hosts of the insect to determine the preference between cultivated plants and weeds and identify and bioassay natural enemies of the of the insect detected in the area <clears throat> so uh, we have mainly two very abundant uh, crucifer weeds uh, london rocket and wild oh, sorry and wild arugula this is the wild arugula and this was uh, well, more images of it we have pepperweed, which is reported as a important host in California, but in this locality, it is not used by the insects. So this is the population fluctuation on broccoli. We're talking about, uh, this is uh, insect for 30, 30 plants. So we're talking, it fluctuated between five to two insects per plant, which is very high, especially if you're talking about seedlings. Um, so uh, on, on London Rocket, this is again population fluctuation. Uh, population fluctuated between one and two plants, insects per plant on London Rocket and on Arugula, on wild Arugula, uh, the same. Uh, we have sometimes three insects per plant, and these are small plants. So this is the population fluctuation. Uh, for the period, there is not really a trend. The insect survives the winter and it is active over the warmer days of the winter. So I'm gonna flip through this. Uh, and we also tested preference between uh, cultivated brassicas and weeds, three weeds. And uh, so we noticed that the insect really prefers uh, brass brassicaceous weeds. So we may th think that the attack on crops is uh, is uh, uh, incidental or accidental. It really likes uh, brassicaceous weeds, and, it, and we think that it's all of, sort of spills over from weeds to crops. When when the now the weeds we have are winter, uh, they're not summer plants. So when this uh, weeds weed host disappears, that's when we seem to have the the problem. So we test uh, again the uh, preference in the greenhouse and. You know, we notice the same trend again. It, it loves wild arugula, it loves London rocket, and it sort of likes broccoli. But I mean, even though they're well, cultivated brassicas are not preferred host, it still inflicts considerable damage to them. So these are the populations. Um, and this is the reason I don't like Zoom because I cannot see the <laughs> a part of my own screen. Uh, but it did shows the preference of the insect for um, weeds. So uh, as far as looking for natural enemies, wild, I mean, uh, field populations of insects were collected and taken to the lab. <clears throat> so Reina detected, excuse me, one second, Reina detected um, five species of fungi. 
five species of entomopathogens. This is just for show. Nice, really, they look really cool. So the most important was Bilveria with a total of uh, uh, 70 of 25 of collected live insects were infected with Bilveria. It was the most important in terms of numbers. We also found Metarisium with 6% of infected field insects. Isaria, 1%. Uh, Fusarium and Sooftora, which is in the Entomophtoralis, killed, uh, well, 2.6% of, of insects. Uh, and there were peaks where remarkable peaks where Belveria killed up more than 60% of insects in some dates. Uh, so again, this was the most uh, important natural, naturally occurring entomopathogenic, entomopathogenic fungus in the field. Uh, this was published, uh, the observations on Sooftora. And these are bioassay data from, from, field, from laboratory tests. We isolated these strains. And this is what you see in, in laboratory evaluation of these polyphagous fungi, you can get high mortalities at, at, in some uh, spore concentrations. This is for Belveria. And uh, Sooftora was also able to kill many insects in the laboratory. Uh, the group in Colegio de Postgraduados, also with uh, Dr. Guzman Franco, <clears throat> has also conducted uh, bioassays, uh, bioinsecticide observations in the laboratory, and they have similar observations where Bilveria cause uh, high mortality, uh, Isaria moderate mortality, so the, ma the most active fungus was uh, in the lab was uh, Bilveria. This is a uh, part of their data. Again, Bilveria uh, cause uh, uh, the highest mortality in these are laboratory bioassays as well. Now, um, Moises Felipe with Inifab now uh, conducted observations on combinations with one fungus, Isaria, and botanical extracts. And he observed uh, uh, additive or synergistic uh, effects with neem. For example, neem uh, has a very low, very moderate activity, but combined with the fungus uh, seems to have a, there seems to be a synergistic or at, at least additive effect in these combinations. In the, the, the asterisks show that synergistic slash additive effect <clears throat> here. Uh, well, this is with uh, lemongrass and the uh, entomopathogenic fungus is area. Um, also, uh, Spinosad. Spinosad uh, show also interesting synergistic effects when combining low concentrations with uh, low concentrations of the fungus. So that seems to imply that we may th they may be a uh, use for bioirrational pesticides against these uh, pests. These, of course, are contact pesticides, including the fungi. So the conclusions uh, for the weed observations, it, it, like I said, it prefers, it seems to love, really love weeds over cultivated brassicas. It seems to be opportunistic in that it, it uses um, brassicas when, uh, or cultivated brassicas when we, wild hosts are not present. So I'm going to flip through this and observations on parasitoids um, observations on parasitoids really quick. Uh, this was a part of Felipe's dissertation as well, um, along with Elijah Talamas from Florida. <clears throat> so we use sentinel eggs. These are uh, eggs obtained uh, from colonies and placed in the field. So uh, Felipe Moises, I'm sorry, uh, laid this uh, or placed these eggs on, on crops and in the field on paper, right? On the ground, occasionally on, on foliage. And he obtained quite a bit of parasitoids from these observations. We're trying to publish this. So we, while we publish this, we published we, we publish on the Salionidae. Three species of Salionids were observed on 
attacking sentinel eggs and one i'm sorry in two species of sensitivity so we observe five parasitoids and one eulophidae which is probably a hyperparasitoid but only one specimen but these wasps uh, the three salionidae and the two ensiridae had interesting uh, attack rates on sentinel eggs reaching up to 34 percent of uh, egg destruction in some dates these are the S, are the Salionidae, and Sirtidae, and the single Eulophid. The, the most important were, of course, the Salionidae and the Sirtidae. And again, these are six species, five of which we're sure that are primary parasitoids. This is the same, just in, as a table. So Moises also observed that uh, he was able to transfer Parasitoids collected on harlequin bug, he, he could make him attack uh, Bagrada. So all I, I have to say also, this, all of these parasitoids are generalists. They seem to have switched, just like the fungi. Both fungi and parasitoids seem to have switched from other hosts onto Bagrada when Bagrada arrived and, and exploded in this area. I think that's an interesting point. And he also verified that he could use frozen eggs for these uh, sentinel studies. Uh, the group in central Mexico at Colegio de Postgraduados, also with uh, Refugio Lomeli and his uh, people, detected one parasitoid and, and they did it from field collected eggs. And, and you know, I have to say that finding the Bagrada bug eggs in the, in the ground is quite hard. <laughs> But they found a very low, only four specimens, uh, about 4% infestation. Actually, they, they collected 88 eggs and four wasps emerged from a uh, genus associated with spiders. So there seems to have been uh, an accidental uh, parasitation. Uh, we, we, we really don't know the extent, I guess, of this uh, host switch in this genus, in Idris Elba, in Idris. So this is Idris. And uh, well, so what is the situation now? The government agencies have been looking at, at this uh, species and, and in Guanajuato, which is the main growing area in Mexico, now is the third most important insect pest after diamondback moth and the cabbage fly. Uh, it is a low, it has a low impact uh, in 2018, it was detected only on this uh, very low uh, parasitism, I'm sorry, infestation rate that I cannot see. Uh, so is the third place now. Now, what, what do we have um, in Saltillo? I'm going to bite a little into the discussion time here. Uh, Going back to the situation in Saltillo, we have a very nice apparent effect of combined generalist natural enemies. Now, the situation I was going to say, the situation in Mexico seems to have evolved for the insect from a very explosive initial years to the present time where the insect uh, is having a low to moderate uh, impact on, on, the, on cultivated brassicas. It's not catastrophic as it, as it was in the initial years of the invasion. Now, why is this happening? Why is the population maintained low? And our hypothesis is that it could be the effect of all these uh, generalist enemies that jumped to attack this uh, invader that appeared in high numbers. Uh, so we have this guild, or if you wanted, two guilds, two groups of natural enemies, the entomopathogenic fungi and the wasps, the, the yellow parasitoids, that attack this uh, pest. So again, we think that it may have to do with the fact that Bagrada doesn't seem to be as destructive as it was in the initial years of the infestation. And this is reflected by the low number of publications in Mexico regarding this insect. This is probably mainly because, like I say, it's not being a big problem these days. And that is good, of course. So what is the, the, the panorama, the, the future for this uh, situation? Well, 
like I said, this is a big business for Mexico, the production of brassicas. Uh, crucifers are, are heavily treated with pesticides for the other, for the pest complex that they suffer. So we have an urgent need to develop IPM programs that include biocontrol for Mexico, for crucifers, for Bagrada bug. Uh, among the needs that I detect is the development of simple effective sampling plans to, to determine uh, economic injury levels and economic thresholds and information on ecology of these and other insects, of course, population dynamics, the distribution, plant house pheromones, behavior, attractor, repellents, biorational pesticides, and regarding biological control, uh, the priority is probably classical biological control, exploration, importation, release, and establishment of permanent populations of a specific natural enemies. This can be parasitoids, predators, or even entomopathogens if they are found. But with the information that we have at hand, we need to focus on conservation biological control. How can we maintain active this beautiful group of natural enemies. And I don't think there are many references uh, anywhere about that many generalist enemies attacking specifically a pest. Uh, and this can be, of course, complemented with inundative biological control, which is the most popular aspect in Mexico to grow and release, uh, to produce the natural enemies. But they could be some of these uh, detected natural enemies, the fungi or and or the, the wasps. So there is a lot to do. So I want to end with uh, just some images of um, uh, Rene Bon. I don't have photographs of Dr. Moises Felipe, but he was also, of course, very active in this field. Thank you very much. And if there are any questions. Thank you, Sergio. Um, Tim already have the, the questions, but um, I'm going to ask you first, what about predators? Did you find something? Well, we, we didn't really look into that. We haven't looked at predators. We observed, of course, the uh, generalist things, collops is very abundant there, and all. but we haven't really looked at predation events. And of course, this is a stink bug, and they are sort of well known for not having very many predators because they stink. Uh, but no, we have not looked at, at predators in any detail. Uh, also, I see that the Talamas that is in Florida and also Tara that she's in Canada, they, they were involved in some works in Bagrada in Mexico. Um, yes. do, you, do you have, Talamas commented something about the parasitoid that is parasiting the eggs of the brown man the stink bug? Uh, what, what about it? Well, the one I mentioned from Central Mexico is a, a spider parasitoid that seemed to have jumped to Bagrada, but uh, you know, it was only four specimens. So we don't know if that's just accidental, but no, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with what you mentioned about. Now, all the, all the wasps that I mentioned, they are all generalists. They are generalists in the sense that they attack sting bugs, you know, different genera, very different genera. All of them have been reported from other sting bug genera. So in that sense, they are generalists across the pentatomidae, across the sting bugs. Uh, and that's, uh, well, of course, very interesting. Moises verified that uh, the harlequin bug wasps will attack Bagrada bug, and that was the telenomus. The telenomus that, that that I reported that I mentioned here. Uh, so that's what we know, you know, that this uh, that there is a group of generalist uh, salionidae and and encirtidae that that are attacking this this bug. They're switching hosts. Okay, thank you, uh, Tim. If, if you have the question for Sergio, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, Sergio, uh, thank you. Uh, great uh, presentation. Uh, really enjoyed it. It's good to see you again. My question, you know, uh, was, um, do you think uh, it's feasible uh, to grow trap crops of the preferred weedy host uh, that maybe would surround the broccoli fields, therefore attract, you know, the bagrata bug away from broccoli um, as a management strategy? You think that's feasible? 
I, I think I think that'll be risky because the the population growth potential of this insect is prodigious. You know, as I show in the on the for, on the photograph of broccoli, you know, that plant had maybe two hundred bugs, and and they reproduce even more on on weedy hosts. So the population growth on those plants is so large that <laughs> I don't know if if it'd be wise to use them as, as trap crops. Maybe if there is a plant, and I think the um, some of the cultivated hosts are more attractive and of a lesser value than, say, broccoli. I think the uh, uh, turnip one, I forgot its, it's name, Raffanus. The Raffanus, it's, uh, what's the word, Ravano? It's, um, well, the, the Raffanus species are less preferred the population doesn't seem to grow as much. So maybe those plants that that result in a more moderate growth and that are preferred above high value of brassicas may be better use because the weeds are just so good to produce bagrada, you know, the, the, the ones I mentioned. Thank you. Thanks. Sergio, um, well, as, as we know, in the center of Mexico, the cruciferous growers, they use a lot of insecticides. You already mentioned it. But um, could you comment something about the possible development of resistance in Bagrada for insecticides, even when the insecticides are not for the species? Yes, yes, of course, because uh, it's, it's an insect that is uh, very exposed. Uh, you know, it's usually on the plants. So yes, definitely. If there are high populations in a row, we, the resistance might might develop. Certainly, uh, let's say it's very exposed. The, the, the pesticides will land on it. Yep. So there is a there is another question. It's from Rene Sforza. Yeah. What is the situation in Mexico for obtaining permits for introducing exotic natural enemies against Bagrada? Uh, well, unfortunately, I guess that situation occurs very occasionally. You know, we don't uh, in Mexico we don't make that importation very often. I think that biological control efforts have been direct have been going in other directions, uh, but. I mean, the, 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 it is a procedure that is established. Of course, Mexico participates with NAPO, the North American Plant Protection Organization. And, uh, uh, you know, most of these efforts have been led by the United States, Canada. So, I mean, it is, of course, feasible. I mean, of course, it is certainly it is feasible to, to apply and obtain those permits, among other things, with the with the approval of, of uh, the other two North American countries. Um, also, we are a member of the IOBC, and I think that the, we have a National Center for Biological Control, and probably they are, um, they are reviewed the, the permits to introduce uh, natural enemies into the country, and uh, I, I believe there is a very close work with, with in, th in that topic because um, I think that uh, members of, of Canada, they also are in the committee for the review of the, of the permits. And well, I, I think that uh, we can introduce natural enemies without any problems. But uh, at this time, I think that uh, we, we we, know, we don't have introductions. We, we got an accidental introduction in the case of citrus. Uh, we had a parasitoid that arrives. Uh, it's, uh, well, it's acting uh, for our benefit, but in the last, in the last years, um, we don't have introduction. I think that the last one was for the hibiscus. Uh, for the pink hibiscus, hibiscus. Yeah. For yeah. Yeah, um, that was about years ago. Yeah, I have another question. It's yeah. about the, the impact of fungicides on the entomopathogenic fungus on the fungi that you are finding. Yeah, 
uh, I have to say also, yeah, these fungi are very abundant in the soil. You know, they are pretty much everywhere. And fungicides do have an effect that has been documented. So that's part of what I what I call the the I mean what what is known as, of course, conservation biological control. Certainly, try to uh, develop IPM programs, trying to well, first we have to detect whether these fungi are here and there, and then try not to disrupt them. Of course, I mean they are every, everywhere, so for sure, uh, they're very, very, very widespread. Um, so yes, there is an effect. So that that should be considered. Uh, you know, if, if this hypothesis hypothesis is true, that these generally generally start keeping Bagrada in check, that will have to be considered also. Thank you, Sergio. There is another question, but I think that the ne next speaker is going to give the information that uh, William Cooper is asking for. The, the, his question is uh, about the modeling the potential for Bagrada Bok to spread to new regions of North America. But um, Jacob, that is, is the next speaker, he's going to talk about it. So. Thank you so much, Sergio. My pleasure. Uh, bonjour y buenos dias. Well, good morning. <laughs> well, we are going to move to our second speaker of the day. Um, he is Mr. Jacob May. Mr. Jacob is an insect biologist in the Biological Control Laboratory at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Ottawa, Ontario. His research involves working with a variety of crop pests and parasitoids in non-conventional and organic systems. Jacob is the Biocontainment Officer for the National Arthropod Containment Facility in Ottawa and serves as the Secretary for the Biological Control Review Committee. So Jacob, please go ahead. Well, thank you for the introduction. I just wanted to clarify here that I am not presenting on Begrata bug, but the uh, spotted lanternfly for this talk. So we'll have to model the uh, Begrata bug in a, at a later date. But thank you for the introduction and thanks to ProSonority for inviting us to show some of our preliminary work uh, where we're looking at modeling applications to determine the potential establishment and impact of the spotted lanternfly in Canada. So just a quick outline here in this presentation, I'm gonna provide you with a brief overview of the spotted lanternfly life cycle and distribution and present our project objectives with respect to spotted lanternfly in Canada. Um, I'll also use a case study from an earlier model to help describe the approach we take towards development of a bioclimate model. Um, for both uh, our, sorry, for our species of interest. So briefly, the spotted lanternfly overwinters as an egg mass, generally laid on a variety of smooth bark host plants, but it will also utilize numerous other surfaces, including firewood, brick walls, dead plant material, and even vehicles for oviposition. The eggs hatch in the spring and early summer, and nymphs begin feeding, often aggregating in high numbers. They'll feed on a wide variety of host plants by piercing the tissue and sucking the sap from young stems and leaves. As they feed through the summer, the nymphs undergo four instars before developing into adults in mid, mid to late summer. The adults seek out their natural host plant, the tree of heaven, and occasionally other plants to commence feeding and mating before overposition begins in the late summer and into the fall. So the spotted lanternfly was first detected in North America in Berks County, Pennsylvania in September of 2014. Surveys taken through last summer have demonstrated that it has since expanded its range with established populations in several adjacent states. In its area of origin in China, the range of the spotted lanternfly overlaps with the range of its natural host plant, the tree of heaven. The presence of Tree of Heaven is important to be aware of and to document as it provides an ideal site for the spotted lanternfly to aggregate, feed, and reproduce. And it also provides us with information to help better understand both the current and the potential distribution of the pest. So in North America, records of the spotted lanternfly are shown generally within the black circles on this map. 
And as we'd expect, when we map the distribution records of the tree of heaven, it's clear that the current North American range of spotted lanternfly overlaps with the range of its preferred host plant. And just for clarity on this map, um, the number of yellow dots don't necessarily indicate the abundance of the host plant, but they are indicative of the current range. There's, there are two regions in Canada where the tree of heaven is currently found. In the east, in a large part of uh, southern Ontario, and in the west, in British Columbia. So while it hasn't been detected in Canada as of yet, the question we're asking ourselves is, will it get here? So since spotted lanternfly has not been detected here, we designed a project with the objective to preemptively model the potential establishment and distribution of this pest in Canada. And this would help us to estimate the impact of spotted lanternfly on Canadian agriculture and to determine if aspects of climate change may impact this distribution model. So in general, bioclimate models utilize climate data and species specific information to predict distribution and relative abundance of a species. The climate, Climax software that we use as part of the DIMAX package consists of a set of population parameters that define the favored ranges of temperature and moisture conditions that allow for population growth of an organism. They also use biological stress parameters that defines a species ability to survive in unfavorable conditions. So there are several applications we can use Climax models for, including but not limited to predicting potential for establishment of an invasive species, exploring climate change and other what if scenarios to determine changes, uh, excuse me, to determine if there are changes in distribution and abundance that may increase or decrease the risk to, in our case, Canadian agriculture. The four major steps involved in developing a bioclimate model using Climax. Each of these steps are quite involved, but in general, they are to parameterize the model using information acquired from an extensive review of the available literature. The second step is to generate a map using these parameters and compare the results with a map of the known distribution of the species. Step three involves modification of the parameters, so the mapped results are similar to the known distribution. This step of the process is where sound knowledge of the pest biology, phenology, host plant availability is very important as it helps make the parameter changes as accurate as possible. And finally, the model that is generated needs to be validated against an independent data set, usually taken from a known distribution of the pest somewhere else in the world, for example, its area of origin. So in step one of the modeling process, we conduct a full review of the relevant literature, focusing on information related to the ecology of the species, including the phenology, temperature, moisture, and potential stressors. Ecological information is critical to the de development of a good model, which may include determining when the insect becomes active in the spring, when it ceases activity in the fall, when adults appear, and what conditions are required for overposition. In addition to that, Stresses, potential stressors like due temperature or moisture extremes results in mortality. Sources can be taken directly from peer reviewed studies. Um, for example, laboratory and field studies can give excellent data on development time, including the number of degree days, um, mortality factors, and much more. It can also provide excellent information on species distribution in both the area of origin and even up to date info on its distribution in new areas, invaded areas. Also important are biodiversity databases such as GBIF and CABI, and even citizen science reporting efforts, which can provide huge amounts of distribution records, and important, which will be important in step two of the modeling process. So in step two, we map the known distribution of the species with data points obtained from the literature review. From this worldwide distribution, we try to define two regions used for model development. Uh, sorry, we try to define two regions. One of them is used for model development and the other is used for model validation. The validation region should have records of the species, but should be independent of the region used for the model development. It's also important to try not to conduct the model runs for this region until you're confident that your parameters are fairly accurate and your model is valid. It helps to reduce bias. <clears throat> So specifically, we're looking at um, 
determine how many occur in each region. And some things to consider for this are what factors are limiting distribution, which can be climate, host crop availability, and diseases. Then we can compare regions where it's very abundant to regions where it's rare and look at what differences may exist. Most important here is to identify the independent data set that you use to validate the model. So looking at the spotted lanternfly and the model we are working on, we used distribution records from the area of origin to begin trying to pinpoint the two regions we are gonna use for the independent data set and the model validation. So in this case, the area of origin being China, the circle around it shows these will be um, our starting point. Now, once you get zoomed in here, zooming in on here, um, we started to look at each data point to determine the validity of the record and the accuracy. In some cases, distributions are listed as a whole country or another large region. Um, and some of the biological databases will record this as the geographic center of this region, which in some cases can be quite far away from an actual area of infestation. For example, the record from Japan on the right side is possibly the geographic center of the country and not actually reflective of the, um, the, the uh, actual range. Likewise, the data point on the left side of the map could also be a geographic center of China and may actually be an outlier from the actual range. You can see there are some uh, squares. This was a preliminary data set. So the squares drawn here, we were trying to really pinpoint uh, you know, where the dividing line should be when we're doing our model uh, validation and our parameterization. So this is what we came up with. So again, the geographic center, this data point on the left side may actually be um, an outlier that we wouldn't use. But for the time being, as part of the validation process, we wanted to attempt to match the climate and the topography of the model development and validation ranges. In this case, we made several considerations uh, to determine our mapping regions, including the proximity of, uh, to water, uh, elevation, total precipitation, and of course, average temperature. So this was, again, this is the preliminary line we have drawn. So what we'll do is use the left side of this map to generate our parameter uh, parameters and the right side to uh, validate our model. So step four of the, uh, sorry, step three of the process involves extracting specific information from the literature research, search and determining values for the relevant parameters that will go into the development. So one of the earlier Climax models that we were, was produced looked at the distribution and abundance of the migratory grasshopper in Canada, as you can see in the top right. This table um, shows some of the key biological parameters that went into the model construction. So these include temperature, um, which, you know, various temperature, uh, developmental temperature limits and optimal ranges, uh, low, high, and optimal soil moisture levels, diapause requirements of the species, including the day length for both induction and termination, average temperature required for diapause, and number of development days required to complete diapause. Other parameters include a variety of stress factors that can influence survivorship of the species. These can be cold stresses, as shown in the table, um, we commonly see these in the north, but also heat stress, drought stress, and wet stress. And then at the very bottom, in many models, a uh, number of degree days to complete development are included. And these can be divided into life stages of the insect, where development might be most vigorous. So once you're comfortable with the parameterization of the model, and you think it's been done as accurately as possible, the distribution and the relative abundance of the species can be mapped. This, can all, this will then be validated with the independent data set. In this case, the known distribution of the species in Canada. On this map, the red zones indicate very favorable conditions for establishment and abundance, which is measured by an ecoclimatic index. That's an EI value that is an indicator of climate suitability. Once you have the model generated, you can use it to make predictions on how individual parameters will change the distribution and the relative abundance of the species. So 
So moving back to our spotted lanternfly model, in order to make predictions on this, uh, the most obvious one for now is in Canada, we have two areas that have the uh, tree of heaven host plant. So the most likely scenario is if and when spotted lanternfly moves into Canada, these will be the regions that it occupies. Beyond that, we're, we're not making any more predictions. So Climax can also be utilized to predict how changes in climate, both short and long-term, can influence the relative abundance of a species of interest. Changes such as, such as the length of the growing season, frost-free days, an increase in degree day accumulation, and reduced overwintering mortality are all factors that will potentially influence the relative abundance and overall model predictions. Climax can also be utilized, uh, utilized to predict how changes, excuse me here, oh, sorry, here we go. <clears throat> so here's another example using the grasshopper model that was generated. At the top of the map is the current climate grasshopper distribution and relative abundance. This was the map that was shown a few slides back. So using Climax, we can actually um, add these climate change scenarios. So in this case, at the bottom of the map, we've added two degrees Celsius. Now, in some cases in, in using Climax, you can actually make regional changes. So, uh, you know, perhaps in uh, the middle of the map in Saskatchewan, the large red zone, you know, maybe that only increases by one degree, but um, a larger region would have a two degree. In this case, we've just gone globally two degrees Celsius increase. And what you can see in this case is a significant portion of the previously either suitable, maybe favorable, but not necessarily very favorable range has become very favorable. So moving to the next one, same map on the top, that's the current climate. And we've actually gone up to a four degree Celsius in increase. And this is showing now the full uh, western part of Canada is uh, is uh, very uh, very favorable. That means it's got a very high eco-climatic index. Uh, and even the right side of a large portion of um, eastern Ontario, south southern and eastern Ontario, is now suitable. So we're going to add moisture to the mix now. So we keep our four degree increase, but we add moisture. Now grasshoppers like it hot and dry. So they've got the heat here, but they've, they've added some moisture, which is not necessarily um, you know, favored by them. So I'm just gonna go back a slide, look at the bottom of the previous slide. So the red zone here, gets slightly smaller, um, adding the precipitation. Now, opposite of that, I'm going to keep the four degree Celsius increase but reduce the precipitation by 20%. We've reclaimed the red zone. And now if you look at the Eastern part of Canada, the right side of the map, you've got quite favorable conditions, which would be a higher eco-climatic index um, in the um, Eastern, South and Eastern part of Ontario. So where does this leave us with our spotted lanternfly bioclimate model? Well, so far our literature review is in progress. The current distribution is relatively close to being completed as far as mapping. And we've definitely begun the model parameterization process, but this is an ongoing process. You're constantly coming across new literature that, especially a, a new pest, there's a lot of publications coming out on the uh, basic biology of, of this, as well as its distribution. Um, so we're constantly adding to or tweaking the parameterization charts for this. Um, we have not done a model validation that's down the road, as well as the predictions. I think I told you the prediction for Canada. If it gets here, it's going to be where Elanthus, uh, the tree of heaven is. So here are some early outputs though. And I just wanted to show you these. Uh, I have a few of these to show you. So again, take this, this is a very preliminary. We generated this from our model parameters. The red area of the map indicates the ecoclimatic indices. Uh, showing high, highly suitable areas for spotted lanternfly. Um, these need to be interpreted with caution as a lot of the parameters, including all of the cold, heat, and moisture stressors have not been included, 
Okay, and we all know that uh, in North America, there's a lot of heat in the south and a lot of cold in the north. It's important to make notes on any changes that are made in the parameters between model runs, because this will tell you, um, this is a critical point to interpreting the effect of each parameter. So if you look at the chart on the right hand side, this is just a, a small table where I've recorded what uh, parameters went into the went into the um, model. So in this case, the moisture is 0 0.7 and that's about to change. So oh, excuse me, that should say 0 0.7, but so we basically doubled the moisture and, th and that can be, um, that's soil moisture. So it's basically at this point over one is basically saturation. Now, um, there's more to it than that, but you can see the red zone here has expanded, uh, moved to the east. So I'll just go back and show you a lot of the north, a lot of the east is not really um, in play, but if it's able to tolerate wet, a wetter environment, then it can spread to the east. Now, we'll keep the soil moisture value, but I'm gonna change the number of development days for uh, diapause. All right, so it now requires 200 days plus for diapause. You see, you lose a lot of the south because it just doesn't have that. Um, you know, it doesn't. It just doesn't have enough of that. So there's lots of diff different things you can play with it. These are only a few runs, um, but you know, over time, when you've tweaked it accurately, you can really start to get to um, uh, properly parameterize the model. So in summary. Um, our objective was to develop a bioclimate model for spotted lanternfly and then try to determine its predicted distribution in Canada. Um, species distribution models can be used as part of a preemptive approach to preventing establishment of alien in invasives. Um, and models can also be used in uh, response to climate change and how this can affect the distribution of pest species as part of a strategic management plan. So thank you very much for listening. I hope this generates some interest in uh, the Climax modeling um, program. Thank you so much, Jacob. Uh, Tim, do you have questions with you? No, uh, is there some in the chat on the Q&A? Okay, I'm going to read it um, from René Sforza. Can you integrate in your model the origin of the infestation like one coming from the US, US with an adaptation to North America climate versus two coming from the native range, China, Vietnam, of course, if it makes sense. So uh, just for clarity, are you wondering if you can determine where the infestation came from or where the, the you know, which part of the, which region the insect came from? Is that what you're asking? Yes, yes. Um, so I'm not aware of that. Uh, I'm not aware of being able to pinpoint it that way. I know there's certainly genetic methods of determining, um, you know, which, which population has supplied the source of the insects. As far as the modeling um, capabilities go, I'm not sure that is necessarily part of it in this case. There is another question from Hester Williams. Uh, how confident are you that current records reflect the true range of tree of heaven in Canada? No, very good point. It's in this case, this is a, a preliminary map generated from, I think it was um, the University of British Columbia. So, the more records we have, the better. There's no, you, you can't, um, with modeling, you can't ever be 100% certain that, you know, you've encompassed every single record, especially we've got this new, new past right in North America. So the number of records that are being generated for distribution records for that are, are ongoing. They're constantly being recorded, I'm sure, because of awareness, people are now in, in Canada recording um, Alanthus, you know, more and more of it. So those records are updated fairly regularly, which means we have to constantly be on top of the, the range. Now, as far as the tree of heaven goes, once we, 
you know, you can, what I should have probably mentioned is we're making a prediction that spotted lanternfly will enter the regions of Canada that have tree of heaven, because they just seem to be that it exists where tree of heaven always is. So, um, but we're not generating the, we're not using this, sorry, we're not generating, generating a model that is relying on Alanthus, the tree of heaven in particular. So we're using the biological parameters to generate the potential distribution of the pest. And then we can overlay the distribution of Alanthus and really fine tune, okay, well, even if it's climate suitable, its host plant isn't necessarily there. So, you know, we'll scale, we have to tweak the model accordingly. It's just, um, it's just part of the process. There is another question from Chandra Moffat. Can the potential distribution of Tree of Heaven be used as, as a biotic factor? to model the potential for a spotted lantern fly? Uh, I think, I hope I covered it just in the last one, but you, you wouldn't rely on, uh, like the, the presence of the tree of heaven is a great indicator of where spotted lantern fly would be able to um, reproduce on. But if the climate factors are not there, for example, if the number of development days are not present, even if the tree of heaven is there, it's unlikely that when you generate your model, you're going to have the ranges overlapping. So I wouldn't rely on presence of Alanthus to determine the um, you know, relative abundance or distribution of the pest. Well, I, I saw your map and, not, and I noticed that uh, there are very good conditions for the pests in the north of Mexico. And in the case of, of Texas, uh, practically Texas appears without conditions for the development. Uh, I was wondering what, why, why this uh, map? Mm -hmm. is, is, is altitude also involved? Uh, altitude could definitely be involved. That would be one of those so first of all, I just want to go back and say, this is a preliminary map. It has no stressors added. So if we look at the southern part of the US, in fact, here, um, here we go. So this is with the soil moisture and the diapause. So this is the required development time, uh, sorry, the, the diapause requirements, which mean below a certain temperature, it will go into its diapause. When it gets back above that, it will come out of its diapause. So there will be a large portion of, you know, none of Mexico here and, and a reduced amount of the United States. If, if your diapause days, your number of days required in diapause um, increase, you're gonna lose the Southern portions because it's, uh, there are not, enough days under a certain temperature to support it. So this is where the, the, the grain of salt, we really have to be careful with interpretation. Um, I'm by no means trying to represent that spotted lanternfly will be in Mexico, <laughs> but as you develop the model, you start to get a range that more closely resembles where it actually is capable of surviving. So to just to go to, so that's the clarity there for elevation. Elevation can often indicate, you know, as you, as it gets higher, uh, lower temperatures. So there could be survivorship or, or uh, mortality factors involved in elevation if temperature changes or moisture parameters change. So it's, it's definitely factored in. And it certainly was part of how we went to validate or to find our, um, our parameterization range and our valid, uh, validation range in China, because there's quite a lot of elevation in some parts. So hopefully that, um, I do want everyone to be a bit cautious with what I'm showing, because these are very preliminary. This is map run 10. It's probably not uncommon to have 500 map runs um, to really get the model, you know, as you tweak each individual parameter. Okay. Uh, there is another question. Um, it's asking about other other hosts yeah. besides the uh, tree of heaven. Yep, 
and and I'm hopeful the next talk will um, maybe provide a bit more of the uh, the distribution and the host range, the host plant range for this. But no doubt they feed on a variety of hosts. But the the common from what I've seen, all of the um, uh, it's almost always the the mating and reproduction is almost always somehow in the presence of the tree of heaven. So I, I, you know, I, I know there are some other papers that have listed 60, 70, 80 host plants, which no doubt, but um, for right now, I don't have enough information to be able to confidently say, you know, grapevines are now um, uh, perfectly suitable host plant from start to finish for spotted lanternflies. So that, that information, I'm hopeful that the more survey work that's done, the more work people are, are doing on the phenology of spotted lanternfly, that more of that information will come out. And all of that can be incorporated into um, the model or, or certainly help to uh, make decisions on parameterization. Um, Jacob, one person is asking about the availability of your model. And if there is a cost, I don't know if, He's asking about the cost to access the, the model. Uh, let me see if I can, is it in the Q&A? Can I read the yes. question? Yes. Okay, I'm looking here. Uh, sorry, I'm not seeing that question. Can you repeat it one more time and I'll I'll see what I can do? Um, it's asking if the if your model is available. Oh, available. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I this is um, the Dymex software package is definitely available, and I can provide the information for it. It is a purchase. It's not free software, um, but it's uh, well. In our case, it's it's very useful. So I can provide that information if. Uh, in the in the Q and A, is that fine? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much, Jacob. Thank you. Um, uh, before I present the next speaker, I have two announcements. The first one is that um, the the presentations are going to be available in the Prosinorte site in the internet. The the link is prosinorte.net. So after the meeting, you, you can go over there and probably, well, probably in a couple of days, you are going to find the, the presentations over there. And, and at the end of Sergio's talk, I, well, I, I made a mistake about the Bagrada and the lantern and the spotted lantern fly. So I gave more work to Jacob about the modeling. Um, Tomorrow, the Prosinorte has a private uh, session, and I think that we are going to, to take uh, this suggestion about the modeling of the Bagrada invasion. Okay? And probably, well, we are going to, to see the possibilities to, to model the, the dispersion. So, our next speaker is Dr. Tracy Lesky. Dr. Lesky is a research entomologist and station director of the USDA Agricultural Research Service, Appalachian Fruit Research, research Station in Kernsville, West Virginia. She studies the behavioral and chemical ecology of invasive and persistent native pests of deciduous fruit crops. I met uh, Dr. Lesky several years ago in a Prusinorte meeting. And at that time, she was leading a very important project about the brown marmorated sting bug. Today, she's going to present the spread of the invasive spotted lantern flight in the USA, impacts and potential solutions. Dr. Lesky, please go ahead. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Very Perfect. Well. Let me share my screen. Are you seeing my full screen? Yes, I see. Thank you. Per 
Perfect, thank you. And thank you for the introduction. Yes, today I am going to be talking about the spread of the invasive spotted lanternfly in the US and some of the impacts we are beginning to learn as well as potential solutions. So of course, spotted lanternfly, or as you'll hear me refer to it throughout this talk, SLF is an invasive species in the USA, South Korea, and Japan. This uh, invasive plant hopper belonging to the uh, family Fulgorida, Fulgor yeah, I can't even speak today, Fulgoridae, um, is native to China, India, and Vietnam. In terms of its life history, it overwinters in the egg stage from October until about June, although we've seen hatch here in the mid-Atlantic anywhere from late April on. And hatch is not synchronous, it's quite um, protracted. We then have four nymphal instars, three of which you'll see here, the first, second, and third are black with white spots. And this occurs from May until about June and July when they uh, molt to the fourth instar, which is red with uh, black and white spots, then uh, molting to the adult stage, um, which is present in the field essentially from July until December until we have killing frost or cold temperatures. And egg laying basically occurs from September to December with the peak occurring at least locally in mid-October. This is the current distribution of spotted lanternfly in the US as of August 30th. This is available on our stopslf.org website. You can find it there. We, uh, up, we update this as new reports come in. But you can see the star where spotted lanternfly was first detected in Pennsylvania in a small area of about four square miles in 2014. Since that time, it has spread throughout much of Pennsylvania, as well as New Jersey, Delaware, New York, Connecticut, um, more recently, Virginia and West Virginia, as well as Ohio, and our most recent detection in Indiana. And I'll talk about this a little bit later, but these um, areas of spread are certainly linked to um, yeah, sort of um, vehicle uh, uh, roadways, as well as railroads. Spotted lanternfly is certainly a landscape level pest because one of the problems is it does have a broad host range. It's been recorded to feed on over 70 different hosts in the US, including, including native and invasive woody hosts outside specialty crops like this grape uh, vineyard, but they can also feed and reproduce in vineyards. And so there's this constant opportunity for reinfestation. So what I thought I'd do today is just talk a little bit about identification, risk of spread and invasion, some of the impacts we're learning about, and some of our potential solutions. And I'll start just a little bit with identification. Um, again, we've talked about this. There are three nymphal instars that are black with these white spots, the fourth instar, the adults, and the eggs. And so this is just some of the key characters. They're pretty distinctive, but the eggs themselves are probably obviously the most cryptic stage. These are newly laid eggs with the protective coating on top. And these are older eggs from the previous year. That protective coating becomes friable and kind of flakes off. And so you'll see these, uh, when you see eggs like this, you know they probably were in, in the area for at least a year. When the eggs hatch, the early nymphal instars again have black bodies with white, white spots. They are strong jumpers and they will jump when threatened. And in the early um, nymphal stage, they have an incredibly broad host range. This is when we see them feeding on all sorts of things from um, Virginia creeper to poison ivy to various broadleaf weed hosts, as well as things like tree of heaven, maple, black walnut, and grape. Um, they tend to feed on the new growth um, where it's a little more tender and their mouth parts can access the phloem. When we reach the fourth instar, again, they are very bright red bodies with the black and white stripes or spots. And again, they are also very strong jumpers and will jump when threatened. And it's during the fourth instar where we really start to see their host range begin to narrow. We see them on far fewer hosts and we see them more often on things like tree of heaven. This is the adult. Um, they are about two and a half centimeters long and the females tend to be slightly larger than males. When 
uh, they first molt to the adult stage, it takes actually quite a while before they begin laying eggs. And so they undergo this period of maturation where the females, you'll see this yellow area on the sides of their abdomen expand and they really are intensively feeding during this period, building up fat body and maturing. And this is when we begin to see mating. And um, you can see just how different even a couple hundred miles or a couple hundred kilometers could make. This these were um, um, photos taken on the same day in eastern Pennsylvania and nearby our station in Winchester, Virginia. You can see how quickly those growing degree days make a difference in terms of egg development for females. And so this is just something to keep in mind as we think about the potential for spread. Now, in terms of mating, uh, this is just the kind of, um, you'll, you'll see them, the males sort of fluttering around the females in the field when they are attempting to mate with her and sort of doing these courtship signals. This is one of, just wanted to show you this. And this is another video of the same kind of behavior. Again, you can see the male fluttering its wings. And we often see them in these grouping postures uh, throughout uh, August and particularly into September. Um, and so that's kind of just a, to give you a little bit about um, identification. So risk of invasion and spread. And I appreciate Jacob talking about these models because I highlighted two that have been published, the Climax model, and you can see that was published by Jung et al. in 2017. And you can see the areas of suitability predicted by their model versus a more recent model published by Wiki in 2020. And you can see there are some differences in terms of some of the Southern um, areas, whether they would be suitable or not. And one of the things that I just wanted to point out that I think is also really important and, and kind of highlights the differences is this obligatory diapause phase for the egg stage. Uh, Melody Kina with the US Forest Service and Ann Nielsen at Records did a very nice study looking at whether there was an obligatory chilling period or diapause for this egg stage where they held eggs at different fixed temperatures of 10, 15, and 20, and also held them at 10 for a period of time, increasing numbers of days, and at five, uh, five degrees for increasing numbers of days. And they looked at the percentage of hatch. And the thing that uh, struck me about this uh, data set is that there is a lot of variation, first of all, and that although we saw, you know, one of the things that we do when we're trying to create a colony, we saw, um, we see that at when eggs are held for a 10 C for about 84 days, we see a pretty high hatch, but also at 15 degrees at constancy, we still see pretty high a hatch. And so, and you can see there's just all of these differences across the board. So the other piece that comes into this is the fact that they don't all necessarily need this obligatory diapause or chilling period. One of the um, projects that we've been working on at Fort Detrick is to develop a laboratory colony. And from some of the eggs that were laid in our colony back in late 2019, we just had some that we had left in our um, greenhouse under ambient conditions. It was about 20 C or so. And by and these eggs would have been laid in October, and November, and by early January, they had hatched. And in fact, we tracked them and 41% of them survived to the adult stage. So some eggs, and it's interesting, not all eggs in an egg mass may hatch at the same time. So some eggs do not require chill, it seems, and other labs have made similar observations. But the point is that this could have implications in terms of spread to various regions if this isn't really necessary, if there's enough genetic variation in the population. So the other piece in terms of risk for invasion and spread is just the potential for uh, spotted lanternfly hitchhiking and human assisted transport. And these are just egg masses, some laid on uh, a cushion on someone's porch, as well as uh, cement blocks at a local company. Um, but the eggs themselves, again, are pretty cryptic and they do lay them in a variety of places. Under laboratory conditions, we saw that 88% were laid on natural substrates, including maple logs, 
grape plants, tree of heaven logs, but another 12% were on altered or inanimate sub substrates, things like the sides of cages, um, just plastic bottles, water bottles, or things like that that were in the cages. So they will lay their eggs in a variety of places, both um, natural material as well as human made. In the field, they lay a lot of eggs on the exterior bark of trees, but unfortunately, in some of the surveys that were conducted in Pennsylvania, a lot of them are outside sort of the vision of someone doing survey from the ground with 75% above six meters in height. So that makes it a little more difficult. Additionally, they lay them on a variety of different um, host plants and um, other objects. So in this survey conducted in Pennsylvania, you can see they were laid on tree of heaven, black cherry, black birch, sweet cherry, other trees, metal fence posts, and stone. Um, and 90, about 92% of the egg masses contained less than uh, 50 eggs per mass, but they hover somewhere between about 27 and 50. Uh, per egg mass. The other challenging thing is that they can actually be concealed. In this case, these are photos we took of ash trees. This is an, a nice um, example of invasional meltdown. Ash trees killed by emerald ash borer and beneath the bark of those dead standing trees were all of these um, uh, spotted lanternfly egg masses being deposited. So it does make it challenging for um, biosurveillance in the field. Here's just a photo of fence posts at the, in vineyards, and you can see the number of um, egg masses being deposited. And also just other inanimate or human-made um, objects where they will deposit their egg, eggs, things like rusty metal and blocks and lampposts and all sorts of places. So they aren't necessarily very discriminating when it comes to oviposition. We tried to do a study to see if we could identify preferred oviposition substrates. This was more geared just to try to help us collect egg masses for our work, but we did put all of these materials out in the field, things that we might find in and around um, uh, human-made structures, things like roof shingles and roof caps and corrugated plastic, vinyl siding, wood bark, netting, mylar, landscape fabric, and we uh, put this up in Tree of Heaven to see if they would oviposit, and they did, and we did find that roofing shingles actually yielded the greatest number of eggs, but you can see they also laid eggs on ash bark, roof caps, landscape fabric, and so the bottom line is they, they will deposit eggs on both natural and human-made materials. So, uh, a number of states in the U.S. in conjunction with our colleagues at AFIS have really developed these um, checklists that homeowners can use if they're moving from one area to another to try to reduce human-assisted transport and reminding people to check all of these different um, materials or uh, um, belongings before they move. And there are similar kinds of checklists available for um, commercial vendors as well. And there are... Um, you know, sort of um, programs that in 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 areas where um, this insect is in quarantine um, that uh, companies are required to complete in order to transport their goods. In terms of just the mobile life stages, the nymphs and adults, we have been kind of concerned about their ability to hitchhike and and then um, us inadvertently transport them as well. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, this is due to the fact that, for example, this is a major interstate where we're seeing this spread, as well as east to west, there is a major railroad line. And so um, one of the things that we're doing right now is to try to understand what speed surfaces and orientations do we, it, do we observe adhesion as well as dislodgement of spotted lanternfly adults and nymphs? And this might help us understand how we might be able to reduce spread. This was just a tweet that was taken a couple of seasons ago by one of my postdocs where an adult was clinging to the side of a tour bus on an invasive species tour and the bus was traveling at about 30 miles per hour. So in collaboration with engineering colleagues, we have developed a wind regime designed to uh, quantify at what speeds um, spotted lanternfly nymphs and adults are dislodged from various surfaces. 
Okay, so that's a little bit about what we know about sort of the invasion and, and risk of spread. I wanna talk a little bit about the agricultural impacts and we're still learning, we have a lot to learn. Um, certainly from South Korea, we know that this, um, this uh, plant hopper was a serious problem on grapevines where they observed wilting, stunting, and city mold growth. And they also um, identified impacts on peach, although it's not well defined exactly what that meant. Um, and certainly they saw feeding causing dieback and decline on walnuts in South Korea. This is actually a picture I took in the Arboretum in Seoul, South Korea in early 2018. These are Manchurian walnuts and they endured several seasons of intense lanternfly feeding. And following that um, time, they were already in a state of decline and probably aren't gonna make it. But in the US, we're still trying to understand what the impacts are going to be. Um, the potential is, you know, across a broad range of potential um, targets, including timber, ornamental trees, orchard crops, which include both fruits and nuts, as well as grapes, hops, and kiwis. And we know that spotted lanternfly is a pest of kiwi in uh, China. Um, we know that their feeding could potentially cause decline in plant health. And as I mentioned earlier, there are at least 70 wild and cultivated hosts that have been um, identified thus far. They also have the potential for kind of indirect agricultural damage just because they excrete such large amounts of honeydew while feeding. And this causes sooty mold growth on leaves and fruit and reduces photosynthesis. And we've also seen it exacerbate stinging insect problems where you have a lot of wasps and things like that coming in because of this sticky gooey mess that eventually smells like vinegar. So it's just not a pretty sight, I can tell you. Um, but to kind of get at this question, um, you know, what hosts are going to be important and what are going to be affected. One of the first studies we did, and this was funded by the US Forest Service in part, was to ask the question, what wild and cultivated host plants can support spotted lanternfly over a two, two week time period. And so we evaluated um, early and late in star nymphs, so first and seconds and thirds and fourths, as well as adults. And they were given a single host to feed on for two weeks. And we conducted these, these were whole tree experiments and we conducted these at Fort Detrick. And so the hosts in this particular study were tree of heaven, black cherry, black walnut, black locust, common hackberry, sugar maple, white oak, mulberry, apple, and peach. And what we saw was that only tree of heaven as, as a single host, uh, supported high survivorship um, for two weeks when only provided a single host. Black walnut also had pretty high survivorship for nymphs, um, but not so much for adults. And you can see the others supported survivorship to some degree, but they were all much lower. We did a second study to find out how effectively they could complete development on key wild and cultivated specialty crop plants. And so in this case, we were using tree of heaven, black walnut, apple, peach, and grape, and then we as single host diets, and then we had combined um, diets of tree of heaven plus one of these hosts. And we introduced newly hatched first insars into these cages and tracked them um, throughout their uh, development. And so the key results from this and implications is that Tree of Heaven, um, Black Walnut, and these mixed diets allowed them to complete development. Um, Black Walnut and the mixed diets yielded low survivorship, but they also yielded faster development, indicating that they could be in the field for a longer period of time. And so these results also have implications for risk in terms of specialty crops and spread. Um, the other thing I'll note is that this particular, in this particular trial, we used um, a muscadine grape. I believe this one was muscadine and we didn't see high survivorship, but on other species of grape, we actually do. So there even is a lot of variation among grape wild versus cultivated in terms of what is favorable to lanternfly. Whoops. Um, so that's kind of what we've been learning and we have another set of these trials going on right now with grape and walnut as kind of the anchor host and then we're mixing diets again. Um, this is a video 
taken in Pennsylvania by Erica Smyers, who's finishing up her PhD um, of lanternfly feeding in a vineyard. And you can see the amount of feeding occurring and you can see the um, honeydew being forcefully, I'll say, excreted by the adult. And so with this kind of intensive feeding, we can expect there's probably going to be some serious um, effects of their presence. And certainly in Pennsylvania, they've begun to de detect significant damage. And this includes susceptibility to winter injury, reduced starch in the roots, reduced yield in the subsequent year, and potential vine death. The problem is, um, because it's not a direct fruit feeding pest, it makes it a little more complicated to um, sort out all of these different factors, but it does indeed look like we're having some serious issues. And for the growers, we've seen tripling in costs of insecticides to try to manage this pest. And just in terms of phenology, really the nymphs are observed on the vines in the spring coming into summer, but they don't really persist. Um, whereas the adults, we see them really feeding quite extensively on these vines through the rest of the growing season. Now, we've also seen them feeding on tree fruit, but like many of our specialty crops, we really don't know what effect this feeding is going to have. And so, <coughs> excuse me, this is one of the active projects that we have going on. Um, being run by my postdoc, Laura Nixon, uh, where we are have, uh, asking the question, what impact does spotted lanternfly feeding have on young fruit trees, in this case, both apple and peach? And what we have done is taken standardized numbers of adults and nymphs, kind of reflective of the life stage in the field at that time, and allow them to feed on apple and peach trees with unexposed peach trees serving as a control. And so our horticulturist is working with us to take measurements of, of the growth and other parameters prior to exposure, as well as um, during each month of this feeding to capture any acute impacts. And then these trees will be planted to follow any longer term impacts of this feeding. But this really highlights the fact that we don't know a lot about what impacts this pest is going to have on a lot of our cropping system. And that really gets into the fact that we really have a lot to learn. We need, need to learn more about its biology, ecology, and behavior. We've learned a lot about host range, but we still have more to go as this insect invades new regions. We're starting to understand dispersal behavior within farms and across landscapes, but there's still a lot of unanswered questions, impacts on a range of specialty crops, such as our nut crops, as well as disease transmission. So with that, I'll talk about some of the potential solutions, both short and long-term. So one of the things um, that we can do with, um, in terms of the short-term and, and management of this insect in both um, in vineyards as well as other cropping systems is to try to manage the egg stage. One of the most effective materials, chlorpyrifos or lures band, is definitely a great material, though we know that this one is being phased out possibly for use. So we're not sure we'll have this um, you know, forever. But we also have other materials like paraffinic oil and dinotefuran, which does, which does have impacts. And um, we also know that um, golden oil at higher rates actually has even a greater impact. But it does mean that there's a room for other kinds of materials or um, strategies to manage the, uh, the egg stage. And so we've been working with uh, David Shapiro Elon at USDA ARS to look at the potential for entoma pathogenic nematodes as a control agent for the egg stage. For the adult stage, I'm highlighting the materials that are recommended by Penn State for nymphs and adults on grapevines. And you can see that it's mainly pyrethroids, a couple of uh, neonics, as well as carbaryl and malathion. Um, and they're all, they are all very good materials. They control the insect adequately. The issue is constant reinvasion. So you kill what's there, but then you know uh, insects disperse in once again. And so you have constant need for reapplication. In terms of post-harvest treatments, um, Spencer Waltz is going to be leading um, studies uh, asking what materials are effective and at what rates. Um, we just got our permit 
approved for him to do some of this work in California. We'll be getting egg masses for this, and he will be looking at some of these materials like methyl bro bromide, phosphine, et cetera, to, um, to try to find um, standardized treatments for post-harvest. Okay, so moving on to monitoring and biosurveillance, one of the issues, of course, is that we need to be able to um, determine when this insect invades new regions. And so our colleagues of at APHIS have uh, taken the lead on this and done an excellent job sort of guiding a lot of this early work where um, st standard sticky bands were used as a, as a means to detect their presence, uh, relative abundance, and seasonal activity. And then our laboratory, as well as our APHIS colleagues, have been trying to design traps that could potentially reduce um, the numbers of potential non-targets that are often captured on sticky bands. And so we were trying to create behaviorally compatible trap designs. And lanternfly have a natural tendency to climb up vertical objects. And so we began experimenting with these turkle traps designed for weevils, um, as you see here, creating larger collection devices and working with commercial companies to create these traps. And so our laboratory, as well as our colleagues at Pennsylvania, put these out over uh, two field seasons. And when I say like non-targets, a lot of these non-targets are not just our invertebrate um, pollinators, as well as um, natural enemies, butterflies, things like that, but also vertebrates. Like we see a lot of skinks and even birds and mammals. And so we really wanna reduce their presence um, and impact on them, particularly when we're dealing with areas where the, the public is um, present. And so, um, these are some of the key results, just showing that this, uh, this modified circle trap performed best relative to the sticky band, and it had significantly fewer non-targets being captured both in uh, studies with adults and nymphs in Virginia and Pennsylvania. And so this really is kind of what everybody's been moving to, I think, for monitoring as well as being put out for biosurveillance. Now, these traps are embedded, and so we have been working to identify attractants um, for these traps to enhance their um, trap captures. Um, these are just some headspace collections that we're doing, and we've done, started these back in uh, 2020, looking at um, volatiles released by Tree of Heaven, as well as the insects, both males, females, or mixed sexes feeding on these plants. And so we have some lures being evaluated based on our 2020 results, and we're also doing um, gearing up for some GCEAD work now to see if we can identify some insect-specific compounds as well. But the other area that's become really exciting in terms of doing this work is uh, eDNA or environmental DNA, which of course is used to find rare or difficult to detect species, and it is based on detection of DNA left behind by the target organism. And eDNA was originally designed for aquatic systems, but there are now methods available for terrestrial organisms, including insects. One of the first, of course, was brown marmorated stink bug. But colleagues at um, Rutgers have designed um, a system for lanternfly as well. And so we've been working with them on this where basically we try to quantify or aggregate this spatially distributed eDNA where we're basically giving trees baths with either paint rollers, wet paint rollers, or we use um, you know, water sprayers. And we take that water, concentrate it through a filter, you know, um, take that concentrated eDNA, e extract it, amplify it and look for its presence. And so um, we've been doing this work here locally since 2020, and we've been able to show that, in fact, we had some positive hits uh, close to my laboratory, but we hadn't yet seen the insects. But as of this year, in 2021, we know the insects are present. So it does seem to be a really good way to detect them early, early before we actually are able to find them visually or in a trap. 
But in terms of long-term solutions, we're really talking about biological control and entomopathogens that can really operate across the landscape. And in terms of biological control, we are seeing a lot of generalist predators out there, everything from spiders to wheel bugs to praying mantids feeding on lanternfly. And we definitely appreciate everything they're doing, but we also have to think about the fact that they still aren't regulating populations. And so my colleagues at APHIS, as well as ARS at the laboratory in Newark are doing uh, host specificity screenings for these potential classical biocontrol agents, two hymenopteran parasitoids and a status orientalis, an egg parasitoid, which is undergoing um, host specificity screening, um, which has high rates of parasitism in China, and this really interesting um, nymphal parasitoid, uh, the Dryana sinicus species, which lays its eggs in nymphs and develops, and it, you can see the little cocoon popping out under beneath the wing, developing wing pad. So it's pretty gruesome, but effective apparently. And so this is still in that phase right now and just trying to see what impacts they may have on targets, but it's certainly something we're considering for the long term. There are also some entomopathogens that have been um, identified, uh, and this work was led by Ann Hayek, where um, uh, Bacota uh, major, as well as Bouveria bassiana. There were natural epizootic events in 2018 when we had a lot of rain in particular. And so these have both been effective under certain conditions if it's humid enough and wet enough. And there have been experiments under being um, conducted in Pennsylvania trying to use these in areas of infestation where literally spraying parts of um, woodlots to see what impact they may have at knocking down populations as well. So all of these are potential longer term solutions that could reduce populations across the landscape. But the bottom line is we still have a lot to learn. We need to understand more about the biology, ecology, and behavior. We have to understand what crops and forest species are at risk and develop sustainable management tactics beyond just broad spectrum insecticides develop standardized monitoring and biosurveillance tools to track their spread, and really continue with this host specificity screening for classical biological control programs as longer term solutions. So with that, I just want to thank my lab group, as well as my colleagues at Penn State, um, Virginia Tech, uh, USDA APHIS, uh, Rutgers, um, U.S. Forest Service and Trace A and our funding sources, and I'm happy to take any questions anyone may have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lesky. There are some questions. Um, mm -hmm. One is, is asking about um, damage on blueberries. Is there any damage? Um, so no, none that I'm aware, although I know that they have been observed feeding on blueberry stems especially the younger in stars. And another question is about evidence on plant pathogen transmission. Yeah, that's an active area as well, which I, I mentioned earlier about disease transmission. There is um, some work being conducted at Penn State and, and some work at Virginia Tech to see if they are transmitting um, things like, you know, anything from some of the, what is it, the some of the grape diseases in particular folks are looking at. Uh, and there is a question from Rene Sforza. Uh, he's commenting that in other plant hoppers and leaf hoppers, uh, there are five instars. And, yeah. Uh, well, he's, yeah. he's asking if you have any idea why there are just four. Yeah, room. it's 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 one of those really interesting evolutionary questions. And Julie Urban, who's at Penn State, she's um, leading our SLF project that's funded by USDA NIFA. She is a taxonomist, systematist, evolutionary biologist. She thinks that the fourth instar and the adult it, at some point there was sort of this, um, you know, they, they lost that fourth instar or something. And it's almost like a combined life stage because that adult life stage, when they first molt to the adult stage, it's a very long time. It takes a very long time for them to mature to the point where they are reproducing and laying eggs. It's almost two months, which is a very long time when you figure they blow through the first four uh, nymphal instar stages in just like, you know, 
eight weeks. <laughs> so we think that might be the issue. That might be what happened, but it's it's a great question. It's so interesting. Uh, Wayne Hunter from Florida. He's asking who is doing the RNA research. Oh, the the eDNA or the yeah. RNA? The R, the R, RNA. Is the the last one? Let me see if I can see the last it. Last question. Um, I don't see it. Wayne has a lot of work in that area. I oh, RNAi, RNAi. <laughs> Thanks, Don Weber. Okay. I was so confused. Um, so I know that there has been discussions. I'm not. Sure. And maybe Don, you should answer. Do you know if anybody's doing RNAi at this point? Um, I know there was talk about it at Penn State, but I don't know that anybody's initiated that yet. Or maybe you guys have at Beltsville. So, no, yeah, okay. So Don doesn't know anyone either. So I'm not sure, but I, I'm happy. I'll check in with Julie Urban and see if I, if I, if she knows of anyone that may be doing that kind of work, and I'll get back with you guys let you know now with with that pest with with that with that new pest i guess that there are some overlapping with the brown marmorated sting bug yeah what is happening <laughs> we wonder who we wonder which of them is going to be able to colonize tree of heaven most effectively it's it's pretty amazing when you're doing a collection for one insect and the other falls in your catchment device <laughs> but um yeah, you know, one of the things that <laughs> my money is on SLF, that's funny. Um, my, um, you know, one of the issues we have right now, and this is where we have some complications, is that um, so brown marmorated stink bug, we also have the parasitoid Trisulcus japonicus, which was discovered in uh, Maryland first by John Weber and his group. And it's spread through a, about a number of other states. And so this, adv these adventive populations have opportunities for BMSB, but they also forage for egg masses in Tree of Heaven. And so with our mitigation programs for Tree of Heaven to reduce the spread of spotted lanternfly, we may be also having an impact on Trisulcus japonicus. So it's all very complicated. And it's very strange to have two insects um, vying for the same tree, but there is also a potential for a biocontrol agent for Tree of Heaven too, which might be the long-term answer. Thank you so much, Tracy. It was a very nice presentation. Um, this, this was the end of the morning session. And uh, now I'm going to give the pass to Tim. Could you take the microphone? Yeah, thank you very much, Jose, for um, you know, moderating that session. And um, our speakers, uh, Sergio and the Bagrata Bug, fascinating, uh, great, um, great talk. And uh, Jacob um, on the modeling uh, for spotter and lanternfly. Uh, that was also uh, very pertinent and interesting. And then Tracy uh, wrapping up this session uh, for what's happening in the US. Um, a lot going on uh, for this very important um, invasive uh, pest. Um, that does end uh, this morning's uh, session on invasive insect pests. Um, we're gonna take now um, a 20 minute break, uh, 10 after the hour. Um, and then we're gonna go on to herbicide resistance. And um, I know some of you who are um, listening in now uh, may be interested in invasive insect pests, but I guarantee you uh, this afternoon's session on herbicide resistance of weeds uh, will be just as fascinating. So I encourage you to come back um, or put yourself on pause uh, for 20 minutes and uh, we'll resume um, at 10 after. Um, hey, Tim? Yes. Sorry, I just wanna mention Don Gunderson Rindle e emailed me and said, to her knowledge, nobody has initiated RNAi to this date because of the need for an insect culture. And that is one of the things we've been working on just trying to establish the culture. So I just wanted to follow up while we were talking about it. Thank you. No, thank you, Tracy. Yeah, very important. Um, this research is, is ongoing. And um, you know, part of the reason we have ProSonorte is to um, develop collaborations. So I encourage um, you know, everyone to reach out 
uh, to others who may be interested. And these presentations, as was mentioned by Jose, uh, will be uh, recorded and put on the Prosa Norte uh, website. So again, uh, I'll see you back um, at 10 after the hour. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, and welcome back or welcome to those who are just joining us for uh, the second session. Um, and, I, and I really uh, neglected, um, and I should have done this at the very beginning, but I, and I apologize, but I really wanted to thank uh, Gloria Ramirez and um, Isabel Giroux uh, for, uh, for my ICA for all of their help um, in uh, setting this up. We, we really could not have done this uh, without you. So thank you very much. Um, and so now uh, our second um, half this afternoon is on uh, herbicide resistance. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Sergio Polo. Uh, he can introduce himself and um, he will be the moderator for this session. So Sergio, thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. I hope everybody can hear me okay. Perfect. Um, so I'm the president director for um, overseeing two of uh, 20 research centers located across uh, Canada with uh, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. Uh, my office is located in London, Ontario, Canada. Um, we conduct research in several areas, including invasive uh, pests and herbicide resistance. Um, our research is for the public good, and we have over 400 researchers working at AFC. Uh, the Prosenarty Plant Health Task Force is a great network, and I'm very happy to be part of this important group. Um, with that, I think we'll get to the first uh, presentation for this afternoon. Um, so I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Valentin uh, Esqueda Esquivel uh, from INFAP uh, Campo Experimental in Cotaxla, Mexico. Um, Dr. Valentin Esqueda Esquivel is a senior researcher at INIFAP in the experimental station at uh, Coaxla, Veracruz, Mexico. Uh, his work has been focused on in weeds of perennial and annual tropical crops. Uh, presently, he's leading a project for alternatives to the herbicide uh, glyphosate. Um, he is going to be speaking about current status of herbicide resistance in Mexico. So, uh, Dr. Valentin, if you're with us, uh, the floor is yours. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Buena hora. Good afternoon. Can you see the presentation on screen? ¿Pueden ver la presentación? Sí, señor. Okay. Yes, we see it. Bueno, pues muchas gracias por la presentación. Thank you very much for your introduction. As we've changed from uh, pests to herbicide resistance, we will also change and switch to Spanish. I work at the Cotachlan Experimental Station with MIFA. It's located in the central tropical part of Veracruz state. Much of my experience then is related to a management and control of tropical weeds. To give you an idea of agriculture in the Arizona and Mexico in 2019, in that year, the main crop was white grain corn with over 6 million hectares sown, followed by beans with a million, almost a million eight hundred thousand, yellow grain corn, mainly used for feed, animal feed, a million and a half, sorghum, a million four hundred, sugar cane, almost 900,000 hectares, wheat, 700,000, orange, Almost 450. Alfalfa, almost 400. Lemon, 210,000 approximately. Soybeans, 187,000. Mango, 180,000. And chili peppers, which are always present in Mexican food, 135,000 hectares. So we have a great diversity of crops. Although we have uh, most of our traditional uh, crops, such as corn and bean, sown in the country. If we talk about crops, we also have to talk about weeds. In Mexico, we calculated about 3,000 weed species, according to 
and Vibrance of the College of Postgraduates. Dr. Vibrance is in charge of the website on weeds in Mexico. His webpage is uh, financed by Conavio, which is a government institution under Dr. Vibrance. It has about 1,000 weed species documented with pictures and enough information. This is uh, about a third of the weeds uh, we believe to exist in Mexico. There is another page as well, which is Naturalista with pictures and localization. Not much information, but many pictures and the uh, points where these were uh, found. And there it has uh, 2,231 weed species. So these are good um, sites to look at if you want to learn about weeds in Mexico. We also have to refer to yield loss of selected crops due to weed competition. I have some of the important uh, crops highlighted here and uh, work that has been done over the years with common beans. If we don't do anything to control weeds, we can see losses of 58 to 70% of the yield. Corn ranges from 56 to 100%, sorghum 38 to 65, soy beans 68 to 90%, and we 30 to 95%. So we see corn and soybeans and wheat are very much impacted. We have a picture to the right of Coboelia uh, cochinchinensis or itch grass versus corn. The crop seems to have no opportunity. And the picture on the bottom has Johnson grass versus soybeans. If we refer to the harmful effects of weeds, we also have to think about how to control them. There are several methods that we can use from hand weeding, where you see the first picture up on the upper left corner, uh, hand weeding in a stevia plantation and they are trying to eliminate the weed that was infesting it. We can also use manual implements like machetes, also mechanical cultivation, tractor trucks, uh, creating furrows, covering with plastic, biological agents. Uh, here it's pineapple in the south of Veracruz with biological control, with bobulus arvensis. However, the most important method to ensure control in Mexico is herbicide application. But we do not have a very uh, positive outlook if we look at these uh, of the chart adapted from E. Rosales, we only have 86 active ingredients of the 326 mentioned in the uh, American Society of Food Science. We only have 26.4% of herbicides that we could have as per the WSSA. And we also only have 15 mechanisms uh, of action of the 25 listed by the WSSA to just 60% of herbicides that could be used. And things get even more complicated because with three herbicides, glyphosate, paraquat, and 2,4-D, they make up 82% of herbicide sales. This is information provided by Procit, which is a, an organization of producers and uh, developers of pesticides. So we have few active ingredients 
and only three of them uh, speak to 82% of sales. That calls our attention and it puts us at risk for many potential problems to control weeds. And my talk is focused on weeds that are listed in the International Herbicide Resistant Weed Database. And uh, in that database, there are 11 species, Phalaris paradoxa, Phalaris minor, Avena fatua, also for weed, Sargonella pensi for corn, Leptoflora virgata citrus, Biden spirulosa citrus, Xophorus unicetus for corn, Elucina indica citrus, Amaranthus palmary cotton, Orthenium hysterophorus citrus, and Chloris barbata citrus. And here you see the distribution in Mexico. Solaris paradoxa minor and Avena fatua are present in the Mexicali Valley with wheat in Baja California, also in the wheat growing areas of the state of Sonora and in the lower lands of Guanajuato, Michoacán, Jalisco, and Querétaro. Sorghum halepensi was found, uh, biotype is found in the south of Veracruz. Leptocloa virgata, Biden spilosa, Hallucinia indica and Parthenium hysterophorus are located in citrus orchards, uh, oranges and Persian lime found in the states of Veracruz and Puebla. And we also have Exophorus unicetus in corn in the region of Jalisco and Michoacan states and Flores barbata in citrus orchards. And these are the ones uh, as registered in the uh, weed database. However, they're not the only ones. I will show some examples later, uh, but they're not uh, included now in the database. They're not uploaded to the web page yet. Some have studies and others that they're only um, the suspicion that they exist. I'll go one by one. Phalaris paradoxa, who had canary grass, was found in 1996 in wheat in Sonora, Baja California, and Bajio. The uh, mode of action is in inhibition of acetyl CoA carboxylase, and it is resistant to all active ingredients you see there plethidin, cyclooxidin. Diclofopnophil, phenoxidine. And it was found that target site resistance is point mutation of a glycine, uh, serin substituting a glycine in position 2096. And this leads to a resistance factor of 2.6 to 23.3 in the different biotypes tested. The uh, control methods recommended for some biotypes, it might work to apply inhibitors of ALS. However, some biotypes not registered in the previous database are also showing resistance to ALS inhibitors now. So this type a herbicide might work on some occasions, but not all the time. But the cultural practices that can work to reduce the infestation is using certified seed, planting in furrows, uh, because then we can add mechanical cultivation to de weed, crop rotation, and we can have pre-planting irrigation to stimulate wheat growth, then eliminating it with a, a non-selective, non-residual herbicide or with mechanical means, and that can help us reduce the populations. 
that same year, we also found Polaris Minor, little seed canary grass in wheat. It was found in the region of the lowlands, Bajillo. That's Guanajuato, Michoacán, Jalisco, and Querétaro. Also in Sonora, Baja California. It has the same mode of action. The ALS inhibition and the same resistance to the ingredients mentioned for the previous grass. 3 point mutations were located here. Uh, leucine, substituting isoleucine in 1781. Aspergine, substituting isoleucine in position 241 and a glycine, substituting in position 2078. Resistance factors vary from 5.24 to 23.41 and uh, control practices are similar to the ones recommended to Phalaris uh, paradoxa as they have a very similar biotype and both occur in wheat. Two years later, wild oat was reported also for wheat. In Sonora, Baja California, and the Bajillo, the areas where wheat is grown, uh, as I showed in the previous map. Also, in addition, of acetyl CoA carboxylase, basically the same active ingredients. Also, three point mutations ASN substituting ILE in position 2041, LEU substituting ILE in 541. And isoleucin substituting leucine in 1781 position, and the different biotypes have led to resistance factors of 1.3 to 5.1. Control is very similar as recommended for Polaris grasses because they come up in the they occur in the same crop. We can also say that some biotypes have shown already resistance to ALS inhibitors. And so they are not a solution in all cases. Only when we have no resistance to ALS inhibitors. Changing to another crop in 2009, we found Johnson grass uh, bio types, sorghum halopensi and veracruz in corn. And these affected inhibition of acetolactate synthesis, ALS, resistant to that. So uh, active ingredients uh, for resistance, mycosulfurin, rimsulfurin, farmsulfurin, and primsulfurin methyl. The found, the Permutation was found, um, ALA substituting proline in 197. We found resistance factors of 122.7 to 186.6 for microsulfurin, uh, 144.5 to 240.5 for rim sulfurin, and 198.4 to 260.2 for sulfurin. This specific case, atrazine plus s methylafluor plus mesotrione for um, sulfurin, iodosulfurin, mesotrione. A colleague that uh, did this experiment told us that the uh, terrain was flooded and there was not much uh, survival of rhizomes, it was more seeds, so that's why some herbicides worked as they would not necessarily work usually for Johnston grass. You can also do crop rotation. Another colleague has uh, told me that he collected seeds in a place he knew there was resistance and found uh, pineapple 
And so he couldn't collect any at that point. So it's a good way to control it. In there was a report uh, for or tropical uh, leptocloa bigata, tropical sprang sprang top was reported uh, on Persian lime, and it was resistant to glyphosate, and a resistance was found where uh, and then. There was a low translocation and absorption. The resistance factor was found in different types of biotypes uh, from 3.2 to 4.9. Now, indaziflam uh, plus glosophonate was paraquat and paraquat. So uh, he's reading the con chemical control and cultural practices include, well, harrowing and mowing. And then we had uh, in, in uh, an orchard of Persian lemon, uh, hairy beggar ticks. And this was in 2014 and it was glyphosate resistant. And we had a specific mutation, uh, uh, 106 serine, and there was a double mutation. An isoleucine that uh, was substituted by uh, a prosine in 106. Well, you can read it there on the slide. And there was a non target site resistance with low translocation. So the resistant factor varied in different, uh, uh, varied from 8.5 to 120.4. And the chemical control included uh, glyphosate, paraquat plus styron, benchon, and, and harrowing and mowing were the cultural practices. And then in 2014 in Jalisco and Michoacan, uh, Mexican grass was uh, found, uh, herbicide resistant weeds in Mexico, Mexican grass. And they found that uh, this was caused by a specific point mutation in the Position 574, where Lucin substituted tryptophan. And they found the resistant factor to be 21.7. So, um, tempertrione, uh, topramizone, and acetochlor methoxamide worked well, as well as crop rotation as a cultural practice for uh, control. In 2016, in uh, citrus orchards, uh, well, in Veracruz, Goosegrass was found that was also glyphosate resistant. And there were two types of resistance at point mutation in position five, 106, where serine substituted a proline. And there was overexpression of EPSPS gene, which provided greater resistance. And they also found that there was a low translocation that wasn't um, tied to the uh, site actions site. And then a resistant factor, resistance factor of 2.6 to 15.9. So chemical controls are the same that are recommended for uh, the previous. And then we found uh, Palmer amaranth in Chihuahua that was in 2016 and it was glyphosate resistant uh, with the point mutation, one of the most common ones, position 106 where sarin substituted proline. And this was tied uh, to low absorption translocation. Among the different uh, studied uh, resistant factors, 12 to 83. Chemical control recommended is uh, up there. And in transgenic cotton, there were different types of varieties as uh, glyphosate resistance, Bulgur 3 and 10 flex. Recommended cultural practices, crop rotation, and mechanic rotation. Sorry, mechanic uh, growing. 
parten de un esterófilo. Mechanical growing, pardon. Then ragweed parthenium was found in 2017 with resistance to glyphosate. Uh, then uh, there was target site resistance, point mutation, pro 106 sir, uh, non target site resistance, low absorption, and translocation. Resistant factor 7.5 to 50.5. And then uh, control was chemical control, bisulfonate. Um, he's reading the, the slide. Swollen uh, finger grass was uh, found in 2018 in an orange uh, crop. It was a glyphosate resistance at well, as well. And this was in position 106, where uh, sarin uh, substitutes proline. Again, low translocation, uh, the herbicide. Resistant factor, uh, 11 to 14.7, enzymatic. Control, uh, similar to what is recommended for other weeds, uh, citrus weeds. There are weed species where studies have been conducted, but they're not reported on Dr. Heap's page, website. We know that there's, uh, or at least we suspect that there is resistance. Uh, it could be even 10 or more. So uh, Echinocloa colona in rice and Salsoa tragus cotton, uh, it's, it's uh, the first one is propanil resistant, found in Veracruz, Campeche, and Morelos states in Mexico. So this Resistance is not controlled with two uh, profanil applications, 20 liter of the product divided uh, into two uh, applications of 10. There are people uh, that are applying 20 liters and they're not even to control it there. So we suspect that it's, uh, that Salsola tragus is glyphosate uh, resistant. That's found in Chihuahua. That's in, in maize, there's a weed that's uh, we suspect is uh, is, is resistant to tebatrione. It's found in Jalisco and Guanajuato, and uh, Conzia canadensis in avocado. Uh, that's in the state of Jalisco, and we suspect it's glyphosate resistant. And some aspects that are noteworthy that uh, that are impacting the uh, evolution of resistance in Mexico, there are very few researchers uh, in the area of weeds. Uh, at, we estimate that there are fewer than 15 people studying weeds just at uh, one university uh, region. And the most of, and most of us are elderly. Uh, we're senior citizens. We need a new generation. Uh, so the federal government doesn't have seem to have much interest in investing in weed science. And there's also a lack of a laboratory to be able to report possible causes of herbicide resistance. And to make things worse, there's a ban right now of uh, glyphosate right now that could lead to the ban of, of other herbicides and that would occur on January 31st, 2024. So the federal government uh, in Mexico uh, has forbidden the purchase of glyphosate or the application thereof uh, in federal, uh, by federal institutions. So that is going to contribute to resistance. I'd like to thank my collaborators, these individuals. Uh, they're all friends as well. I'm very experienced in resistance, but these individuals are, uh, they double my experience. Dr. Enrique Gonzalez Robles, he's an INIFAB retiree, and he's an advisor for weed management, in weed management rather. Uh, Dr. Enrique Cruz Hipólito, that works 
at the FMC agrochemicals, uh, the private sector, and then Dr. Luis Miguel Tamayo, uh, who works at the INIFAP in Sonora, and Dr. Tafoya Razo, who is a researcher and professor at Chipingo Autonomous University, and then Dr. Medina Cazares that works on the experimental side in at the INIFAP. So if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you, Dr. Valentin, a uh, great presentation. Um, so I do see a couple of questions um, on the chat. Um, I'll try to bring those up really quick. Um, so, and uh, apologies for my, my Spanish. Uh, the first question is, uh, ¿Cuál es el status de megatarsus uh, maximus como malea? What is the status of uh, megatarsus maximus uh, pendicum maximus as a weed? Questions were. Okay. Por favor. Can you please repeat the, the question? When you pronounce it in Spanish, um, he didn't hear. Could you just, you can read it in Spanish again, that's fine. Sure. Um, ¿cuál, es, cu ¿Cuál es el status de megatiruses maximus como Dice, malea? ¿Cuáles son los factores? Es que no oigo. No. Okay, he's not on the English channel, so go ahead and you can, um, you can say it again. Okay. Just say it in English. Okay. Well, what is the status of um, megatirus maximus, panicum maximus as weed? Megatirsus maximus. Megatirsus maximus uh, yes. really is, is a crop. It's uh, a grass that's cropped, uh, sorry, that's a crop in tropical and subtropical areas of Mexico. Occasionally, it kind of uh, escapes to uh, citrus orchards, uh, to um, uh, grasslands, uh, to, uh, but in my experience, uh, it's not a weed that's too aggressive. It doesn't have much of a presence. Uh, I think that it's similar to Johnson grass than Megatirsus maximus. It has much of a use, of use, of a use. Uh, you can even see people um, that report it and they even take it to feed their their uh, livestock. So at least in Veracruz, it's, it's not as invasive. Um, you can find it. Uh, it's some orchards, but not to the degree uh, that of invasiveness as other grass, as uh, Lelcon chinchinensis or Johnson grass. Uh, okay. Great, thank you. Um, and there's a follow-up question. Um, Estas uh, mutaciones surgieron in Mexico? Uh, did these mutations originate in Mexico? O son cosmopolitas? Bueno, lo que estoy presentando yo son estudios well, de... What I'm presenting are studies of weeds in Mexico, but these mutations have been found in, in many other places. There are some species that had never been reported in other areas. For example, Spidum, uh, Spilosus. Uh, these were the first reports worldwide here, were here in Mexico. But other mutations uh, that... Um, Wild, for example, birdseed, uh, deco decosulfurin can be found in other areas of the world. But mutations that I found here are uh, studies that are uh, just from Mexico, just done in Mexico. Gracias. Um, the next question I have um, is um, what techniques or technologies are being used in Mexico to detect populations in the field of herbicide resistant weeds? Basically, you saw that we have very few people working uh, on this. Sometimes it's coincidental. We uh, don't have really an active program to uh, detect resistance because we're working uh, in different fields, not only resistance. So it's when a farmer pretty much comes out to us and reports the fact that he can't control a specific weed. Uh, that's when they go to the INIFAB and they report that. And that's where we start the research. So we don't have a detection program that monitors this continuously. Uh, 
we react pretty much because we don't have enough people working on this. So we depend on, on people reporting their issues to us at the NIFAP. And then that's when we go and help them and see if it's about, uh, if we're dealing here with resistance or poor application, or uh, maybe uh, a weed escaped, or it's not always uh, resistance when, when herbicide doesn't uh, uh, survive applications. Thank you. Uh, the next question I have is, um, is the Kamba registered for use in Mexico? I think it is. Yes, it is. It's registered. Perfect. Um, and then we have another question. Um, Algún herbicida en México uh, compuesto con estos ingredientes um, activo emazipic y amazapir? Para el control de malezas en, en maíz. No, no entiendo la pregunta. Hey, can you read it? Can you read it in English? Just because I'm um, not because of your Spanish, but because he doesn't hear the Spanish. He only hears the the Spanish channel. It's so I'm kind it, of. It, it's taking... written in Spanish. It's written in Spanish. <laughs> can you um can you read it again and then I'm slower. Sure. And sure. I'll repeat it. Um, algún herbicida en México uh, compuesto con estos ingredientes activo y mazapic e amazapir. Para el control de malezas en mes. Bueno, eh, lo que pasa es que Mazapic. What es happens una... is that Mazapic is a very is a residual and a herbicide. It's very expensive in Mexico. It's it's residual. We can say, what we can apply it um, along the road in areas uh, where there's no planting done, uh, no crops. Well, on crops, only sugarcane, perhaps, or peanuts, uh, you can find that. But in sugarcane, well, we haven't found that uh, this this resistant weed. Uh, there are many herbicides that we can use to control resistant weed. Uh, there are many. However, it depends on the crop. Uh, that really limits us. Uh, if it were like just planted along the road, the fan of the gamut of possibilities would be very broad. But if not, we have to resort to other besides. Uh, we could use that provided that uh, we have the right conditions. I'm not just going to apply it anywhere. Perfect, thank you. And uh, for the sake of time, just to keep with the schedule, we're gonna move on to the next speaker, but there are, might be another question or two. Um, I know there is one in the question and answer. So if uh, Dr. Valentin can take a look at those and maybe uh, um, type in an answer to some of those questions, that would be appreciated. In the meantime, uh, we're gonna proceed with the next uh, speaker. Um, so we have uh, with us uh, Dr. Marty Williams joining us. Oh, I see on the screen, Martin. Nice to meet you. Um, so Dr. Martin Williams is an ecologist in the Global Change and uh, Photosynthesis Research Unit, um, USDA Agricultural Research Service in Urbana, Illinois. Uh, the goal of his research program is to make commercial vegetable production systems more productive, more profitable, and more economically sound, uh, environmentally sound. Uh, Marty has a farming background, completed a PhD in agronomy at the University of Nebraska, Lincoln in 2000 and led research on irrigated horticultural crops of the Pacific Northwest at Washington State University before joining USDA ARS in 2003. Uh, Marty serves on the executive board of the International Sweet Corn Development Association and is an associate editor of Weed Science. So welcome, Dr. Martin. Um, he will be speaking about the herbicide resistance in the US, uh, the critical need for innovation and diversity. The floor is yours. Thank you, Sergio. Are you able to hear me clearly? We are. Okay, good. And let me get my screen shared here and get my slides up. Okay, can you see a big orange slide? We can. Excellent. I'm ready to go then. Um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity to join this meeting. I'd like to thank Tim Widmer for inviting me to make this presentation. Um, my Actually, my first ag research experience was with herbicide resistance. At the time, I was an undergraduate student at uh, Truman State University, and I studied the uh, 
fitness cost of trizine resistance in jimson weed. Um, while that experience started me on a career path that I continue to enjoy today, uh, my focus uh, of my current research has not really been centered on herbicide resistance per se, um, but more on generally solving crop and weed management problems with a particular emphasis in vegetable production systems, climate change, and resiliency. Uh, so aside from the fact that I work on herbicide resistance peripherally, I'm going to make one other disclaimer before I get started here. And the, the focus of this talk will be on row crops in, in the Midwest part of the U.S. But I, I hope you find my message, my key message here applies well beyond these boundaries. Um, Herbicides are the most widely used tactic to kill weeds in U.S. crops. In fact, herbicides are used more than all other pesticides combined, at least based on mass. Uh, here are the 21 most widely grown crops since the 1960s, uh, sorry, herbicides used on, uh, sorry, pesticide use of, in, in U.S. crops over, over the last, since 1960. And, um, Herbicide use peaked at about 1980, which is close to where we are here in recent years. Widespread herbicide use, in some cases misuse, has resulted in exceptional herbicide resistance. Uh, I'm sorry to report that the US leads the world in herb at least documented herbicide resistance cases. Uh, Europe was leading the way for quite a while till about about 2000, and here is the US. Uh, Canada is on this uh, graphic as well. And clearly, you know, no doubt, herbicide resistance is a worldwide problem. Weed populations resistant to multiple sites of action emerged in the 1980s. In the last two decades, multiple herbicide resistance has become a growing concern. We now have populations of Amaranthus tuberculatus, commonly known as water, water hemp, is resistant to six unique sites of action. And that, I mean, honestly, that almost sounds like science fiction, but it's, it's not. It's what we have and the beasts we're dealing with. It's quite a testament to the adaptive nature of weeds. While commercialization of herbicides, which on this graph is this solid blue line, grew steadily from the 1940s to the 1980s, that pipeline has since stagnated. And as you know from previous slides, herbicide resistance, which is the red line here, uh, has become the norm. So where are these trajectories headed? James Westwood and others predict little activity in terms of new herbicide commercialization in the near future, which is this blue dashed line. And we'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. Um, nonetheless, they predict a continued rise in documented cases of herbicide resistant weeds over the next 30 years, this red dash line. And over the next few slides, I'll provide some context for those predictions. First of all, there has been consolidation in the herbicide industry. In 1970, there were nearly 50 companies were developing herbicides. This involves synthesizing, screening, uh, and developing herbicides in the US. And that count includes uh, even if the parent company was, was located overseas. Today, there are four companies. Patent applications have declined too. These tend to be uh, largely herbicide mixtures or formulations of existing active ingredients. In 1990, there were 250 active ingredient patent applications. By 2006, there were less than 60. Industry's focus is on developing, largely, largely the focus is on developing resistant traits to currently available herbicides. For any herbicide or herbicide class in the market, basically the objective is to find a mechanism to confer resistance to a crop. This list shows you the, uh, those traits that are not related to glyphosate. However, all these technologies 
cannot ignore the fact that herbicide resistance already exists in weeds uh, to these, this class, these classes of chemistry. And there can be unintended consequences. For instance, dicamba tolerant soybean was adopted by the US in the year 2017. Application of dicamba to dicamba tolerant soybean has stirred considerable debate here in the US. While dicamba has been around for decades uh, and its tendency to volatilize are well known, later in the season applications of lower volatility dicamba formulations in dicamba tolerant soybean is a brand new deal. Off-target injury to sensitive plants, not just conventional soybean, but all manners of other plant species in the landscape is documented throughout the US Corn Belt. Here I simply show the number of dicamba complaints, which is the, the blue bars here uh, to the Illinois Department of Ag. So you can see that complaints emerged in 2017, the first year of dicamba tolerant soybean and complaints have cl cl climbed since then, um, and not just in Illinois, but a number of, of Corn Belt states. So academia government research, and government research is stepping up to deliver novel weed man management solutions, right? Well, not necessarily. Uh, they're downsizing too. In 1982, the Weed Science Society of America had 3,417 members. Today, WSSA has approximately one third that amount of members. Just as of a few weeks ago, WSSA had 1,106 members. While some of this reflects industry consolidation that I talked about a moment ago, many weed science positions in academia and government have been lost through attrition, budget cuts or budget stagnation and redirections. So in that sense, I think uh, there's a lot of parallels to what um, uh, Dr. Valentin was talking about uh, in, in the previous talk. Unfortunately, we're headed into a period when weeds are not only harder to control, but also may have greater impact on crop yields, thanks to climate change. We know a fair amount about uh, the influence of greenhouse gases and other environmental conditions on crop growth and yield. While the impact of climate change on crops has received some study, all these projections of future yields assume the crop is weed free. However, my experience is that weeds are present in every field. And for many fields, weed control is less than complete. Crop losses due to weeds are a continuous threat now and well into the future. Environmental factors that influence the crop, such as air temperature and water supply, also impact the weed. So how might climate change impact crop weed interactions? My lab recently published a journal article in Global Change Biology on this question, specifically for maize. We have another paper coming out on soybeans soon. So we considered a host of crop management factors, uh, weather factors, and the level of weed control throughout the life cycle of crop. We then used a machine learning, a couple of machine learning techniques to identify the most important drivers of crop yield loss. We found that when weed control is incomplete, when I say incomplete, I'm saying less than 94% control at maize silking, weeds exacerbate the deleterious effects of heat and or drought. Now this makes intuitive sense because weeds compete for limited resources and the crop must deal with multiple stresses simultaneously. Here's the challenge. The Corn Belt is expected to have greater occurrence of heat and drought in mid and late summer. Also, our current weed management systems are fraying at the edges, to say the least. Uh, there's a cause for concern because diminishing weed control exacerbates crop yield loss to such adverse weather that we're expected to have more of in the future. So it should not be a surprise to you when I say my title of this talk, you know, there is a critical need for innovation in and diversification of weed management. We need real innovation, new tactics, and preferably lots of those tactics. So we also need to act now to add diversity to weed management. 
diversity in the herbicides that are used, how they're used, the crops we plant, and a host of other weed management tools. In the immediate term, perhaps the help we need the most are from sociologists. And I'm not joking here. You know, perhaps they can help determine how we make accurate information better adopted. After all, many of my extension weed science colleagues have extolled the importance of managing herbicide resistance for decades, yet little appears to change. In order to bridge this gap between science and practice, we must take into account the factors constraining farmers' decisions. And no doubt economics plays a major role in that. If we wanna extend the useful life, uh, useful life of existing herbicides, I'd argue we need cooperative solutions. Herbicides are a common pool resource. They're available to everyone. Well, here in the US, there's, there's obviously more options than in Mexico, but they're available to quite a few folks, but the utility is eroded by that very use. And herbicide resistance is a, a tragedy of the commons. A tragedy of the commons is when the short-term benefit to an individual outweighs long-term damage to the utility of that project. I'll give you an analogy, my lab's work truck. There's no immediate benefit for someone changing the engine oil. But if the engine oil doesn't get changed regularly, the engine will wear prematurely. Eventually, the engine could be ruined and we no longer have transportation if someone doesn't step up and change the oil. Jeff Evans and others did some interesting modeling work based on field management records of growers fields throughout central Illinois. They showed that using glyphosate alone, uh, they showed that it was using glyphosate alone <clears throat> in Roundup Ready corn or soybean, the time it took for the herbicide to fail actually decreased as uh, fields were pooled together. However, as management size increased, and you got to think of this as uh, treating a collection of fields uh, as one, when they, when they pulled them together and treated them very aggressively, uh, the years it took for an herbicide combination to fail actually increased. In other words, the useful life, useful life of herbicide combinations was prolonged when her farmers and their neighbors were working together. Um, so cooperative solutions are when strategies are developed at a larger scale, a scale that maximizes the benefit to all instead of the benefit to the individual. You know, the challenges of resistance to herbicides is not unlike the resistance to antibiotics. What's the difference? Well, there's several, but for one, antibiotic resistance emerged in 1940 and in the last decade, has had a concerted global effort to manage the problem. The medical research community is not out of the woods yet, but they're working on it. So their efforts included uh, relevant global authorities were commissioned to develop reports for stewardship worldwide. Uh, new molecule discovery research was incentivized by a push and pull mechanisms and big data and artificial intelligence were implemented to improve discovery and management of new antibiotics. Herbicide resistance has trailed in comparison. While the first case of herbicide resistance was recorded in the 1950s, there's been little global effort beyond the international survey conducted in the mid 1990s and the formation of a herbicide resistance action committee. Undoubtedly, there are differences between use of antibiotics and herbicides, but given that herbicide resistance is a global problem, it may very well require a global effort to develop solutions. Predicting further out, several would argue for the need for new herbicide targets. That's certainly the sense that I get from growers in the Midwest and an expectation of new products coming out. You know, but the first question is, do novel good herbicide targets still exist? A few targets have been identified in recent years, and I have them noted here. And that may, may lead to commercialization of products targeting new sites of action in certain small grains. There is considerable interest in natural products too. These could be byproducts of microorganisms 
or extracts of plants. Uh, but don't forget, new herbicides, they have to tick a lot of boxes. They must be highly efficacious, broad spectrum, cheap to produce, have a low chronic toxicity, and have an appropriate residual, residual profile. That's a pretty tall order. And regulatory requirements have increased product development costs and shortened lifespans to recoup those costs. You know, eventually companies must make a profit to stay in business. So the bar is pretty high to achieve that given this current environment. So let's talk about other types of innovation, such as genetic engineering. Uh, direct genetic control of weeds involves direct modification of the pest genome. RNAi, short for RNA interference, involves manipulating naturally occurring biological processes that limit expression of target genes. Think gene silencing. In weed science, an application of RNAi, RNAi could be to block a weed's tolerance to an herbicide. Obviously, there would be challenges to overcome, but it is an interesting idea. Another idea is a gene drive. So a gene drive results in a biased inheritance of a gene or a set of genes in wild populations of target organism. An effective gene drive spreads throughout the population on its own. Now, I see two types of applications of a gene drive. One is population suppression. And a hypothetical example is altering the sex ratio of a dioecious weed species. Perhaps we can introduce a gene drive that results in all offspring being male. Over time, it's feasible to drive the population to extinction because no new seed is produced. A second application is sensitizing. A hypothetical example is introducing genes that prevent seed from shattering. We then collect seed at harvest to prevent seed bank additions. Both applications probably face some pretty significant issues of ethics and regulatory policies, but uh, I'd have to admit they are very novel. We can also talk about indirect genetic control of weeds. That involves modifying the crop germplasm to impact the pest. And crop competition, crop, crop competitive ability is one type of indirect genetic control of weeds. My lab has published several articles showing agronomic and economic benefits of using plant density tolerant sweet corn hybrids. These hybrids, some of which are commercially available today, can be planted at above average plant densities above what's currently the, the current standard plant density. This is a, this relatively simple tactic increases profitability to both the grower and the vegetable processor. And we've shown in previous work that the more competitive crop environment improves weed suppressive ability too, because the crop is preempting very limited resources. There are methods which exploit weaknesses in life history traits of certain weeds, such as emergence patterns. Cover crops are a great example. In the US Corn Belt, generally cover crops are planted in the fall after crop harvest. They overwinter and are terminated in the spring. Cash crops are then planted into the residue, which is often left on the soil surface. So instead of a bare soil condition, there's a surface mulch and that can alter the microclimate. It can influence nitrogen availability and release allelochemicals into that weed seed emergence zone. The absolutely most important aspect of cover crops in my mind, at least a big hurdle is finding selectivity between crops and weeds, which from my personal experience can be very difficult for many crops. Nonetheless, cover crop adoption has risen in the last decade due in large part to other ecosystem services they provide, such as soil health and water quality. The Australians have led the way in harvest weed seed control. Harvest weed seed control involves reducing seed bank additions by capturing or treating weed seeds that mature by the time of crop harvest. There are several approaches to harvest weed seed control. And an engineering solution involves separating the chaff from the straw at harvest and running the chaff through a cage mill. 
that mill can damage or destroy many weed seeds that enter the harvester. And while the machine shown here is pulled behind a combine, cage mills integrated into the combine harvester are commercially available in certain countries, including the US. A group of my colleagues have been exploring the use of this technology in US soybean production systems. Even if seeds aren't destroyed, their physical integrity can be compromised, exposing them to soil pathogens and decay. Where I see a tremendous amount of potential for innovation is automation and weed management. Automated weed management is the merging of traditional technology, such as sprayers or tines with robotics. The general setup includes a recognition system, which is often a camera, but it could be a GPS enabled map of the crop. The next component is an image processing system for real-time images, the image processing system must distinguish crops from weeds. That system is linked to a microcontroller. The microcontroller controls actuators that turn on or off a spray nozzle or apply steam, operate a flame, engage a knife, etc. While there has been progress in differentiating crops and weeds, there's room for additional improvement to work effectively across a broad range of field conditions. Commercial products are now available, including some that operate behind a tractor, such as the RoboVader, and some that are fully autonomous. Uh, FarmWise has a product that I don't have a picture up here, but uh, is being used commercially now. What actually kills the weed, again, it doesn't have to be an herbicide. We're seeing use of some of these commercial products, mainly in California and the salad greens and a few other high value vegetables or fruits. Will this have application in other crops of lower value, such as widely grown ag agronomic crops? Time will tell, but there are many benefits of this technology over herbicide development, including the lack of regulatory obstacles and the sheer number of engineering and tech companies that could build them even on a regional or local scale. Big data in agriculture, venture capital, artificial intelligence, predictive analytics. There are many companies working to position themselves to existing and new market share in agriculture, including crop production. And some of these and others are tackling weed management. The emerging model appears to be one more of marketing pest management services rather than chemicals. Let's hope some of them are successful in commercializing innovative project, uh, innovative products for weed management. And let's continue to work to encourage growers to adopt a greater diversity of tactics to maximize the useful life of not only existing technologies, but emerging technologies. Uh, those of us in academia need to equip the next generation of scientists with the skills, knowledge, and abilities that they'll need to succeed. And those of us in research need to steer our research programs in ways that solve the most pressing problems. All right, uh, thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts at today's meeting. I hope you found this talk useful. Uh, on this last slide shows my contact information if you would like to reach out to me. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, Dr. Williams. Uh, great presentation. Um, I see that uh, there might be a question uh, on the chat. So we're gonna limit it to just a few questions just for the sake of time. But um, the question that I see here is, um, uh, Marty, what about biological control with the herbivores, uh, mainly anthropods and pathogens against weeds? Uh, what is biocontrol's role? Yeah, what is biocontrol's role? That's a good question. Uh, yeah, certainly a role. And there's there's been work on this in weed science. I, I see most of the success stories, I. I'm aware of have occurred more in in natural areas or rangelands, uh, more you know like where there's perennial less disturbance uh, um, and more uh, perennial types of of weeds and cro crops. But certainly, um, biocontrol with with herbivores, you know, and in cropping systems, that that's one we we have a, a very short list of <laughs> of of examples of success there, but um yeah I, I think 
you know, we already have models of success with that in, in some of the natural systems. And, and there's probably more, you know, there's no doubt more work that needs to be done there. Thank you. All right, I think with that, and uh, I'm gonna move on to the next speaker, just to keeping track of time here. So again, thank you, Dr. Williams, a great presentation. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna welcome uh, Dr. Eric Page uh, from AFC Government Canada and Harrow Canada. Um, Dr. Page is a researcher with AFC. Uh, his expertise is in the area of weed and crop physiology. Uh, Dr. Page's herbicide resistance focus is in the population biology and management of resistant biotypes and the identification and understanding of the molecular mechanisms of resistance. Uh, today, uh, Dr. Eric Page is going to be uh, speaking to us about the challenging times uh, for glyphosate use in Canada, evolution of resistance, impacts on efficacy, and the development of alternatives. So with that, um, Dr. Page, welcome, uh, and please, the floor is yours. Thanks, Sergio. Um, I'm going to share my screen here, and then I'll ask you to let me know that you can see it, Sergio. Absolutely. And I can see your screen. Okay. Perfect. Oh, well, thanks. Uh, I guess I should say thank you to Sergio uh, for asking me or providing me the opportunity here and, and all the other organizers to, to speak to you today. Um, it's, it's my pleasure. It was great to hear Marty again. I haven't seen Marty for a long time, but uh, I, I won't make him feel too old, but just to say that uh, some of my early experiences in, uh, in my field of weed science actually occurred under Marty's guidance in my master's. So it's, uh, it's always great to hear from you, Marty. And uh, so I'm here today, and, and I should say Marty introduced a lot of great topics that um, he's going to save me a lot of time in uh, covering some of the background information, um, if you've listened to, to what he had in his presentation. I'm going to take a little bit of a different focus than, than our two previous speakers did. Um, my focus is going to be specifically on the herbicide glyphosate. Um, its use in Canada and some of the challenges that uh, that we see coming up. Um, this has been a topic amongst all of our um, AFC weed scientists. We've actually had some meetings in the last little while that have been organized by my colleague, Brian Tidman, just discussing this topic and where we need to go, uh, recognizing the issues that are, that are facing glyphosate use in Canada. I'd also just want to acknowledge um, my co-presenter, Dr. Rob Nurse. He also works with me at AFC here in Harrow. And uh, you'll see throughout the presentation that I've um, managed to elicit some slides from all of my AFC colleagues. So this is a bit of a presentation from the AFC Weed Science Group um, in, whole, in, in its entirety, not just my own. Um, so with that, um, this was just meant to be, again, just a little bit of an overview of what I wanna to touch on today in this presentation. Uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the scale of glyphosate use in Canada and Canadian agriculture. Um, I'm going to also discuss the evolution and impact of resistance to glyphosate and uh, in specific reference to uh, Canadian agriculture. Again, I'm a row, primarily a row crop uh, weed scientist, crop physiologist, so most of my examples are going to be coming from row crops. Um, and then I want to kind of end up on, you know, some of the current pressures on glyphosate. And these have been talked on, uh, touched on by the two previous presenters as well and as well as some of the potential alternatives that uh, we as a group of scientists in AFC uh, are working, are actively working on. So this is a, a map of Canadian field crop production. This comes from our 2016 census. So it's a little dated. There is gonna be a new ag census coming out shortly. Um, I believe they're tabulating the results now, but this is the most uh, up-to-date information that we have. And so what you see here is basically the acreage of major crops across our provinces. So stretching from the Pacific uh, in British Columbia on the west coast of Canada, all the way over to Nova Scotia and Newfoundland on the east coast of Canada. And so um, what I wanna highlight here is that in 2016, we had about 92 million acres of, again, this is row crop production. There was a separate slide for horticultural crop production. I didn't include that as, again, I'm primarily focusing on horticultural crop production. This is uh, a little older data, but um, this is pesticide use on farm from 2011. And again, this is Stats Canada uh, from their surveys. And what I wanted to highlight here just was the use of pesticides in Canadian agriculture. And so the number that I'm gonna be looking at here is that first column there for herbicide use. 
So what it means is about 70% of farms in 2011 reported using herbicides on farm. Okay, fairly rough number, a little dated number, but they'll get me to my point here. So if you basically take 70% 70, uh, 70 of, uh, actually, I skipped a point there. I'll say that glyphosate is far and away the most commonly used herbicide across those acres of field crops. Um, I would even make the argument that glyphosate probably sees the ground on 70% um, in this case, the 70% of farms that use herbicides. I would say that glyphosate sees the, uh, is applied at least once, regardless of the field crop that's in use. So if it's wheat, if it's canola, if it's corn, if it's soybeans, all of these cropping systems, I would say you're either using glyphosate as a burn down or using it in crop at a minimum once. So I'd say it's fairly safe to say that, you know, 70% of those 92 million acres or 65 million acres of Canadian agricultural land sees at least one application of glyphosate a year. That's a pretty staggering number. And, and this is a very, probably in a large part, uh, uh, quite a significant underestimate. As I've said, there would be normally multiple applications made in my area if you're growing corn or soybeans. Out west, if you're growing, you know, herbicide tolerant canola, you'll be making multiple applications of glyphosate. So it's a very, very, very important uh, product for Canadian agriculture, indeed for agriculture in the United States and Mexico and worldwide. Now, what comes with you know, widespread use of a product is obviously resistance. And, and I'll credit here to uh, Dr. Ian Heap's website as well. This is a map of glyphosate resistant weeds worldwide. I have Canada highlighted there. We aren't quite as far along as Marty pointed out as the United States. We tend to follow the United States. What happens in the US happens in Canada about five to 10 years later. Um, we're, I guess we're just a little slow and that's okay. So we've got currently six uh, glyphosate resistant weeds uh, that are recognized on Ian's website. Um, you can see that Australia and the United States have uh, higher numbers. Um, I don't have them presented here, but just with the bar that's down at the bottom there and the shading in blue, as you go darker, you have more resistant weeds. So that's our current status um, in terms of glyphosate resistant weeds. How did that happen? Well, in terms of chronological order, um, the first glyphosate resistant weed in the United States, I believe was Canisa canadensis, which was reported in 2001. We obviously were a little delayed. So our first weed was Ambrosia trifida, giant ragweed in 2008, followed closely by Canisa canadensis in 2010. 2012, we had both Bassia scoparia and Ambrosia artemisifolia, and subsequently 2014, 2017, Amaranthus tuberculatus and uh, Brassica rapa in 2017. I have the unfortunate uh, responsibility of saying that um, Ambrosia trifida, Canisa canadensis, and Ambrosia artemisifolia, all three of them were first reported in the southern part of Canada, where I work in Essex County, just across the border from Detroit. Um, we seem to be a hotbed uh, for the development of glyphosate resistance in Canada. Basia scoparia or kosha was reported in Western Canada um, in 2012. We do now have a newly reported case of glyphosate resistant kosha in Quebec as of this year, I believe. So those are the species um, that are causing us the most problems in terms of resistance. And I just you know, as with resistance, you always have the first report and then you have the evolving story. So I want to just take a couple slides and just give you an example of some of the AFC research that has been documenting um, the spread of resistance following the initial reports. So these slides come from uh, Dr. Charles Yedis, who is our AFC weed scientist in Lethbridge. Charles um, has the unfortunate responsibility of following the footsteps of uh, Dr. Bob Blackshaw who was a very long standing weed scientist, very well respected weed scientist in uh, Western Canada. But uh, Charles is doing a great job. Um, this is uh, an initial report on glyphosate resistance in kosher in Manitoba from 2012. I can't see because the picture is in the way of my 2012 or 2013. 2013, there, I can move it. And this is adapted from uh, a publication by Hebecki in 2015 that, that Bob Blackshaw was a part of, I believe. 
And so at this point in time in uh, 2013, again, is one year after the initial report of glyphosate resistance kosha, we had 1% resistance, um, as I have there noted on the side. Again, I have to move my picture so I can see what I actually have written on the slides. 1% resistance of kosha. Makes sense, it was just reported the year before. Um, the great part about AFC weed scientists, um, I would say over the past, 20, 30 years in Western Canada, they've done extensive weed distribution surveys as well as herbicide resistance surveys. So there is a wealth of data, particularly of the prairie provinces, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, um, Hubecki, Julia Leeson, Bob Blackshaw, um, that were responsible for gathering this data. And what it allows them to do, when I flip here to the next slide, this is, um, you'll see a study that Charles was involved with. Um, this is the follow-up in 2018. And so you go from 1% resistance in Manitoba to 58% resistance in three years time. So that's always part of the questions we have. It's always different with every resistance mechanism, every resistant weed. Kochia is of course a tumbleweed, so spread is quite rapid. Um, it also has very little population structure, which facilitates uh, uh, resistance movement. Um, it doesn't, it, it's a real pain in the butt, um, is the short answer. Now, what Charles um, told me and what was in a different slide that I didn't add in here, the wrinkle to this, uh, to this study also was while you saw the, the movement front in five years from 1% to 58% resistance in glyphosate uh, resistant kochia in Manitoba, um, at this particular survey, there was also 1% resistance to dicamba and cross resistance between glyphosate and dicamba. So I'm assuming that Charles will also be looking to do a survey in five years time and looking at that cross resistance, uh, the development and spread of, of cross resistance between group four and group nine, so dicamba and glyphosate and kochia. Just an example of uh, how following the initial reports, we still need to be able to, uh, to track the development, of development and spread of resistance. Moving back east a little bit, this is uh, one of the weeds that I work a lot on. This is glyphosate resistant Canada fleabane or mare's tail, uh, Caniza canadensis, Originon canadensis. It has many names. Um, as I may mentioned previously, this was the first broadleaf weed that was reported as resistant to glyphosate. That was back in 2001 by Mark Van Gessel in Delaware. And in that, um, I believe, rapid report that he had published, move that over again. Uh, he said that uh, this particular weed uh, developed resistance after only three years of using only glyphosate in a continuous glyphosate resistant soybean. Of course, that is not what we recommend for stewardship in terms of herbicide resistant or herbicide tolerant uh, programs. This was the early days of Roundup Ready, right? Roundup Ready was introduced, I believe, in 1996 in the United States. So Mark was one of the early weed scientists sort of sounding the alarm on the use of this system. At that time, or subsequent to that initial report, um, there was a lot of work done on the mechanism of resistance, and they sort of settled on um, non-target site resistance in glyphosate-resistant Canada flea So there was no target site mutations that were reported. Um, subsequently, in a couple of the slides that I'm going to show you now, we have developed target site resistance to, um, to glyphosate in this weed species. And I'm, I'm going to show you why that's kind of important. This is a, uh, a dose response um, that came from one of my publications in 2018. And I'll just orient you to the slide a little bit before I tell you why it's important. Um, so on the y-axis, we have above ground biomass as a percent of control. On the x-axis, we have glyphosate dose in acid equivalent per hectare. And we have three biotypes that I'm showing you here. Um, we have, I guess it's, I've got the, axis, or the order opposite here, but the susceptible, which is in the green squares. We have the non-target site resistant, which is in the, uh, I guess, also green, I'm kind of colorblind, green uh, triangles. And then we have the blue, which I can see, which is uh, the blue target site resistant. Um, so I should say that the susceptible and the target site resistant biotypes in this particular graph come from Ontario. So those were, those were some populations that I had. 
The non-target site is an original sample that was sent to, um, to us by uh, Mark Van Gessel of his population, or as close as he could get to his original population. So this was the basis of our 2018 publication where we did report uh, for the first time a P1 of success mutation in uh, target site mutation to glyphosate in canned fleabane. And in that publication, what we found was really interesting was just this extreme level of resistance. You can see that you can't even fit um, a sigmoidal curve or you know, your normal dose response curve um, here to this uh, target site resistant population. It's basically a straight line over this range of doses where you see the non-target site and the susceptible, the susceptible has a rapid decline at low doses. The non-target site is providing you know, about, you know, I'm gonna say, uh, well, it would have an ED50 of around, um, uh, 1250 in terms of the, uh, the dose that would give 50% control or 50% reduction in the biomass in the x-axis. So, and, and with a normal 1x dose being around the 900 grams. So sufficient uh, resistance to, you know, be noticed and then be called resistant. So that was the original population. And we were seeing much, much higher levels um, when there was a target site resistant um, a mutation present in that biotech. Subsequent to our work, which I, I should say is actually kind of opposite to what the normal feeling about target site mutations was for glyphosate. A um, number of, um, I'd say, well-respected lead scientists have, have commented or written um, in manuscripts that um, target site mutations based on the, uh, on the binding chemistry of, of where they're located aren't predicted to produce very high levels of resistance in glyphosate. It's different for other um, modes of action, like um, I guess I would give group two ALS, where you can see you know, 100 fold resistance with a single target site mutation. Glyphosate was not expected to have that happen. So our results were a little counterintuitive. After we'd published this, um, I guess I'd, I'd wanted to highlight that point, but I'm gonna keep going. After we published this, uh, I got in touch, or, or I was, uh, I got in touch with Allison Snow, uh, who's at Ohio State, and, and she was in the midst of doing a survey with Mike Owen, who's out in Iowa, and they were looking at um, extreme levels of resistance. This is something they had started on their own. Um, they had been collecting populations in Ohio and Iowa in, of Canisa canadensis from agricultural lands and um, border, um, uncropped borders. And they requested to get some of our biotypes. And then they decided that in combination with their screening, they wanted to look for this presence of this target site mutation at P1 of success. And what they found was uh, pretty interesting. So when they had already grouped out their biotypes into four levels of resistance, going from one to four, four being the highest, all 25 biotypes that they found, and these biotypes were spread across Ohio and in Iowa. So, you know, distinct, I would say distinct selection events or evolutionary events, whatever you want to say. All those 25 biotypes scored in the highest groups of 20X and 40X levels of resistance. So if 1X is 900 grams, 40X is a lot of glyphosate. Um, all had the same substitution, proline serine at P106 S that we had reported. So it's really nice, you know, that somebody was able to, to verify what we had. I think that this particular mutation was present in um, the United States long before we ever reported it. It was just by happenstance that we, we happened to report it. And I think Allison's results really confirmed that. And the reason I wanted to highlight this point really was just going from Van Gessel's initial report where we knew we had non-target site resistance that provided an acceptable level of resistance to glyphosate or you know, enough to cause production problems. We continued to use glyphosate widely, probably even more after it was reported. And I think that maybe there's three important points or at least three important points when it comes to talking about resistance. You have the initial report of resistance, then you have the spread of resistance. Then what happens after you know, the spread. Are you still talking about the same mechanism? Are you still talking about 
you know, maybe you're talking about multiple mechanisms that are conferring enhanced levels of resistance. Are you still selecting that population? And I think the answer has to be yes, we are still selecting it. And, you know, if we're not, you know, using some of the resistance management strategies that Marty was talking about, this is what happens to our active ingredients through overuse. So to complete the story, I wanted to bring you back to this slide and very quickly just say that we're not done with this yet. Um, after we've been working with Allison and, and doing you know, this work that we've published, we decided to cross these populations and to try to split if there was multiple resistance mechanisms in the target segmentation population. And so we created segregating F2 populations between these two parents. So these are their profiles in terms of you know, their response to glyphosate. And so I'll just share with you some of the results. We haven't published this yet, but um, we feel pretty good about it. So at 7,200 grams acid equivalent, which isn't on this graph, it's off to the far right-hand side, we had 68% survival in our F2 populations, okay? We subsequently genotyped all those survivors for P106S. We developed a, an allele-specific um, assay that is specific to EPSPS2 in Kaniza because there are three EPSPSs and specific for P106S that allowed us to distinguish between homozygotes that have P106S, heterozygotes, and then also wild types. 28% of the survivors were wild type at 7,200 grams. So without a doubt, we are seeing in that target site resistant population, it actually has multiple resistance mechanisms. And, and it shouldn't be surprising. I mean, I think we all expect to see multiple resistance mechanisms, but it's just perhaps the extended use or the continued use of glyphosate has selected for multiple resistant mechanisms that have enhanced the resistance above the initial uh, report. This is the reality, I would say, of the resistance situation in Canada, and probably I'm going to extrapolate and say through, through the United States, we have high levels of glyphosate resistance in a number of weed species. That's a major headwind for the use of glyphosate, um, continued use of glyphosate in our agricultural systems. But ironically, I would say it's not the primary challenge to the use of glyphosate in our agricultural systems. I grabbed uh, a couple of headlines from recent publications. Um, I'll just read them out to you here. Health Canada stands by approval. Um, actually, I can't even read that one because it's in the way. You guys can read that one. 2019, Health Canada said that glyphosate was safe. Um, recently, they've extended the deadline of public consultation on higher MRLs in certain foods. Um, they were originally set to, to release that, or, um, but they decided to take a pause on it. There is significant public headwind to the use of glyphosate in agriculture. And this is the number one threat to using glyphosate. Um, for example, Bayer bought Monsanto and then they got a whole lot of headache. Um, they are gonna remove glyphosate from lawn and garden market by 2023. I think that's an acknowledgement of the headwinds that they see for their product. Um, recently in Ontario, glyphosate out is dry bean desiccant. Our Ontario bean growers board told their bean growers, do not use glyphosate as a desiccant for your crop. That was standard practice. Our export markets will not tolerate any glyphosate. This is the number one challenge to glyphosate use, for sure. So what can take its place? I think Marty touched on that. I, I think this has to be the discussion that we have going forward. It's too important a product to you know, get to the point where they pull the plug on it and it's no longer in our markets. It's no longer an option. Um, these discussions are going on worldwide. Here's a couple of uh, publications that come from our former AFC colleague, Dr. Hubecki, who's now in Australia at their Herbicide Resistance Institute in uh, uh, Perth. Farming without glyphosate. That was in 2020. And then the global challenge of field crop production without, uh, with limited herbicides. That was in 2021. And that's taking the discussion beyond glyphosate because it has to be acknowledged that 
it's not just glyphosate that's under threat. Paraquat is also off the market in Canada. It's one of the few non-selective products that's there. You have glufosinate, you have diquat. You don't have many options for a burn down from a, from a herbicide standpoint without those products, okay? So we know the problems. I'm sure everybody hopefully is sitting there nodding and saying, yeah, but heard that before. It's the solutions that are the tricky part, right? Um, glyphosate was a once in a generation product. Um, I think Steve Duke said that in one of his reviews. Um, it's broad use pattern makes it really hard to replace. It's used preceding fallow edge of field management. That's where we first started using it. Then we started using it in crop with you know, tolerant cultivars, but we still have that other use pattern that I mentioned to you before as a desiccant or a harvest aid. That's another important use pattern for glyphosate. It's used at every step of field crop production. It's striking how much it's used. Um, and this is one I also want to highlight. I think Marty touched on this as well. Glyphosate continues to enable no-till. I would almost argue that it did enable no-till aside from the mechanical and you know, engineering feats that allowed us to have no-till drills and uh, you know, soil saving practices. You don't do that without glyphosate is very hard to do. So what are the implications of the loss of glyphosate on soil health, greenhouse gas mitigation and carbon sequestration? This is what our management, I'm sorry, you need to be thinking about. Um, uh, solutions, um, I, I don't wanna spend the time being negative. Um, I do want to talk about solutions and I want to highlight some of the work that AFC is doing on different projects that I think have potential to replace some of the use patterns of glyphosate. We will not have a single silver bullet solution. I'm sorry, as Marty said, it's going to have to take a diversity of solutions. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on here, but new modes of action, I'm not holding my breath. Um, a return to old modes of action, I think, is on the cards if we lose glyphosate. Um, can you design a tank mix that has multiple effective modes of action to replace the burn down application of glyphosate and still be economical? I don't know if you can. This is a place where I see the most innovation um, is in the physical side. And, and again, Marty touched on some of these things. Tillage, yes, tillage. Um, maybe not the tillage that you're thinking about. The Australians are doing uh, some targeted tillage with the uh, weed recognition technology that Marty highlighted. That's a place that I could see some tillage happening um, and it may be necessary. Harvest weed seed control, electrocution, lasers, robotics. These are all places where we have innovation. Um, rotations, cover crops, intercropping and the cultural aspects. I think these are great places. I do work in a lot of these areas what I have to say is that some of these practices are very difficult to um, start up without having a herbicide tolerant crop to follow that you can come in and clean up volunteers. Volunteer control, I think, is one of the undersold um, benefits of glyphosate or non-selective products that you can use out of crop. Uh, I think that's a really important mode of action. So anyway, and then lastly, genomics and its application. I think there is room here also for quite significant innovation and I'm gonna to touch on these. So I'm gonna highlight a couple AFC projects that are working in some of these areas, not all of them, okay? So harvest weed seed control, I think Marty introduced it. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on um, describing what it is. Um, this is really amazing technology. I think there is a lot of potential for this. It's only starting. So Dr. Brianne Tideman out in uh, Lacombe, is the lead uh, AFC researcher in this area. And what I'm gonna just say is that, uh, as Marty highlighted, highlighted, you can reduce weeds, weed pressure. You can reduce the seed bank size using this type of technology. You can help to manage resistance. It, it all depends on what weeds are still there at harvest when you go through with the combine. Um, I do think that there's potential there for control of volunteers. As I highlighted, I think there is a need for, you know, active planning for some of these innovative um, cropping systems for volunteer control. What are some of the barriers? Significant cost, seventy-five to $100,000 um, for one of these mills. You can buy a lot of Roundup for seventy-five to $100,000. 
Um, lack of efficacy data, um, Brianne is tackling that. I mean, for Western Canada, there is data, as Marty said, from the Midwest, from the Southern United States, from Australia. We're starting to you know, fill in that picture. That one will be checked off. But also, you know, farmers don't need it. In large cases, herbicide still works most of the time. So that's that societal question that I think was brought up so, so well from Marty's talk. Um, how do you convince them that, and, and really, if you think about it, that, that example of how you could delay resistance with a community approach that, that Marty showed, I would think that in terms of distribution of weeds and weed pressure, if you had a number of mills working on acres that were in almost like a watershed approach or you know, a community approach, you would knock down the populations. You would have less in you know, non-cropped areas. You would, you would have that community effect. Um, how do you get that to happen? I'm not sure I know how to answer that. Signs of it catching on, there is some positive things. So only two were running in Sask and Saskatchewan in 2019. This is Brianne's, I know her personal data. She goes out and gets and finds out who's bought them and, and keeps records. All the way to now in, 20, in 2021, we have seven or nine of them in Saskatchewan that are running. So that's just one province, but, but I think there is, you know, there is uptake. Um, it is a positive story. It's just how can we get them in the hands of more farmers? I don't think any of them are running in Ontario. Let's just put it that way. And it's cost that's driving that, but they should be. This is another project that I just want to very briefly highlight it. I, um, I had to go to the company website and I love the fact that they said, you know, don't just kill weeds, annihilate them. Um, uh, it's great. I had to cut and paste, but this is uh, old school manufacturing. I think it's a company out of the United States. Basically, this is a commercially available electrocution unit. Um, and this is something that Dr. Rob Nurse has been working on. Um, again, he's a colleague of mine here in Harrow. And this photo here is from one of the trials that Rob had this summer, just showing a velvet leaf seedling after it's been electrocuted. It's not a solution to all the problems of replacing glyphosate. Um, just because of its application, you couldn't electrocute the crop, right? You're only going to be able to do pre-harvest crop topping. Um, you can use it as a crop harvest aid. Um, and what, yeah, that, that's really the one part that I think it has its greatest application is replacing that harvest aid application, particularly in edible beans or preceding fallow management. Limited applications, but if you can check off some of the boxes for glyphosate, this would check off some of them. I know I'm getting short on time and I'm cognizant of that. I don't want to keep anybody longer, but I do want to touch on the potential of genomics very briefly. This is something that we are working on in AFC. This is some of our work. This is uh, from a paper we published in 2020, Dr. Martin Laforet, Sarah Martin, myself. This is a chromosome scale draft genome of Kanaisa canadensis. Um, I believe right now this is the most uh, complete and contiguous weed genome available. 98% uh, of the genome is presented here in the nine scaffolds that you see to the right. There are nine chromosomes in Kanaisa canadensis. What you see highlighted there with the little um, icons um, in green, you'll see the three EPSPS copies. Um, you'll see many other herbicide uh, target sites, ALS, HPPD, PDS, PPX. This is a roadmap. Um, in addition to those herbicide target sites, um, we also identified through gene ontology, 159 ABC transporters, 49 glutathione S transferases. These are the other genes that are implicated most frequently in non-target site herbicide resistance. We know what's going on from a genetic standpoint of Kanaisa canadensis. How do you apply it is the next question. We're not the only ones producing genomes. Um, the International Weed Genomic Consortium is uh, up and running. This is an initiative uh, spearheaded by Todd Gaines uh, at Colorado State and Eric Patterson at Michigan State. They will produce 10 high quality weed genomes similar to what I just showed you in three years. Um, this is backed by industry, Bayer, Corteva, BASF, I would argue if they see value in this, um, and it's still not that cheap to sequence a genome, it's getting cheaper, but they see value, we should see value. And so I wanna talk a little bit about 
um, RNA interference, which Marty again introduced. This is straight from uh, the Rave paper. RNAi targets could function as herbicide synergists and or as standalone herbicides, depending on the, the efficiency of transcript silencing that can be achieved. That's the potential. Um, RNAi is reliant on you know, having high quality draft genomes so that you can design species specific RNA interference for knockdown. Or I guess if you wanted to, you could try to go across genuses, say for the amaranths, if you wanted to target Palmer and um, uh, water hemp, you could in theory, if you had genomes of the two of them, design your RNAi to knock down you know, whatever gene, be it a herbicide resistance gene or another critical function gene across the genus. Still a lot of work to be done, the very early stages, but the potential is there and the draft genomes are gonna support this type of work. This is just a little more evidence that industry is industry interested in this. This is BioDirect. This was from 2013. They were purchased by Monsanto. And what this picture just shows you is glyphosate resistant Palmer, glyphosate resistant water hemp. When Roundup was applied on the left, um, and then when BioDirect uh, was included, and BioDirect is an RNAi product, where you have in both cases of these resistances, the resistance is conferred by overexpression. So you have the knockdown of the overexpression through the RNAi target, and you have the recovery of the efficacy of glyphosate. It's not always going to be the case, depends on the mechanism of resistance, but in this case, when it's overexpression, it looks like it worked. Haven't heard anything more from um, Bayer now about this technology, but they did look at it. So this is, uh, again, Dr. Martin Laforez leading this project. It is ongoing. We are looking at kochia in the prairies. We're looking at the amaranth, specifically water hemp in Ontario. We're looking at the ragweeds in Quebec. Um, we have genomic information for um, a lot of these weed species. Uh, be targeting ALS and EPSPS, and again, um, looking to either recover the activity of these products in resistant biotypes or looking at um, actually producing RNAi that could potentially act as a, as a herbicide itself. Certainly in susceptibles, that's what would happen if you knock down the expression of one of those genes. I want to just come back here and say I've covered a lot of ground. This was sort of the framework that I had put, put it out to you. Um, I see the RNAi sitting here somewhere between biological and chemical. In Canada right now, from a regulatory standpoint, RNAi is viewed through the lens of chemistry, so it would still go through the chemical uh, registration process. That may be a challenge. Where I think there could be collaboration is if EPA and PMRA got together and decided whether that's the appropriate way to evaluate this technology. I don't know if it is, but um, I think that has to be part of the discussion because it's neither a chemical nor a biological, um, in my mind, a traditional biological uh, pesticide. So I think, I think there has to be innovation in our thinking of how we classify and evaluate these things. Wrapping up, final thoughts, last slide. I know everybody wants to get going. Glyphosate use in Canada, and I would say worldwide, is challenged both by biological and societal pressures. We can't control the societal pressures, unfortunately. Um, they may drive the reality that we have to live in. We can try to address some of the biological pressures, and I hope you saw through some of the presentation that we have some solutions that can address the, you know, the use pattern that glyphosate has. It's, it's very broad. We can start to address some of those use patterns with various solutions. I want to put a plug in here just finally just to say that weed science needs to be considered in the climate change greenhouse gas soil health discussions. Um, I don't know how you can achieve the reductions that are on plate that Canada has signed on to in the, in the uh, Paris Accord, what is it, I think 30, 40% by uh, 2030 without glyphosate. Agriculture is being looked at as a mechanism to help make those reductions. You would do that with uh, sequestration of carbon through no-till uh, soil health principles. It's very hard to do that without glyphosate. Um, I don't have the answer, but I think that has to be part of the discussion. 
And then finally, I just, you know, I really can't help um, but to, to push this. I, I think we are moving from the promise of genomics and weed science to the application. I think that's within reach, um, 10, 15 year goal. I, I do believe that we can um, either resurrect some of these modes of action or um, basically design RNAIs as a, as a herbicide op alternative. So with that, I'm going to say thank you for listening and I'll turn it back over to Sergio. All right. Thank you, Eric. Uh, great presentation. Uh, for the sake of time, I am going to ask you, if you don't mind, just to reply to any questions that we have uh, maybe in written. Um, I, I can see that your presentation did resonate really well uh, in terms of the glyphosates and, uh, you know, whether um, the social aspects of it, um, and that's clear in some of the questions that we're receiving on there. Um, so feel free to answer them that way. Uh, but for the sake of time, I'm going to pass it over to Tim. Great. Thank you, uh, Sergio, for uh, moderating uh, that uh, session. And uh, to our speakers, uh, Valentin, uh, Marty, and Eric, uh, you know, I, I promised uh, that they would be um, worthwhile and uh, you delivered. So thank you. You know, there seemed to be a common theme in, uh, you know, all three presentations. Herbicide resistant weeds are going up. They're an issue. Um, you know, chemicals are, are having problems. And also, weed scientists um, to solve these problems are going down. And we need, uh, you know, to, to uplift um, and to train uh, new scientists uh, in weed science. Um, and especially as, you know, Eric just mentioned with climate change, you know, invasive weeds, especially, um, it's going to be a big issue. Uh, now, I'd just like uh, to, uh, to wrap things up. Again, thank you all for attending. I'd just like to give um, Sergio and uh, Jose, my uh, other committee members, uh, just a final word, and then um, Jean-Charles uh, after that. So, uh, Jose, uh, please. Gracias por todo el apoyo que recibimos por parte del staff de ProSinorte. Thank you so much for the support received from the team. Without your support, this uh, session would have been impossible. I'm very thankful to the uh, speakers. They truly make uh, this event shine. This is our annual event. I hope that we met the expectations of the attendees. It was wonderful to see that we had so many people connected all the way up to South America. Our group uh, is uh, mainly for uh, our North American audience, uh, but now that we held this virtually, we had many more uh, participants uh, attend the meeting. Thank you so much. Go ahead, Sergio. All right, well, I'll be brief. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you everybody for participating. We had a great turnout. Um, Tim, thank you for uh, today too, as uh, leading the group, uh, the task force, you, you've done a great job. So uh, I know it's not easy, so appreciate everything you've done for us as well. Um, you know, these presentations were great, but uh, this is a great network as well. There's a lot of a, a great uh, researchers in here doing just, uh, you know, uh, cutting edge uh, research. And I know it's uh, can be challenging sometimes to see how uh, this affects, uh, you know, farmers today, but uh, for us uh, here in research, we know uh, that this will have long-term implications and the work that we do is critical and very important. So I'm glad that everybody participated. Uh, keep in mind all the contacts that we have and, you know, reach out even after these sessions. Um, this is a network. Uh, it's great to, uh, you know, to get feedback from everybody. So thank you again. Thank you, Sergio. And that did uh, remind me, um, and I put into the chat um, the, the, um, the uh, website for Prosa Norte that you can uh, look and uh, see these presentations again. Um, probably give us you know a week or two, uh, but check back. Uh, they will be um, on the website. And now uh, our final say uh, from our uh, leader, um, Prosa Norte, the Executive uh, Secretariat, uh, Dr. Jean Charles Vallée. Uh, Jean Charles, please. Thanks, Tim. Excellent. Uh, thanks for plugging in the the website too. Very important resource. Um, Really fantastic turnout. Well done, everyone. Uh, hat tip to all the team, uh, translators, the uh, logistics team, task force members, uh, our thanks to Agriculture Canada, to NEFAP, USDA. And really, this theme is very important. You can see there's demand for this. We've had over 500 registrations, several hundred people participated in the morning and this afternoon. The 
tremendous interest in protecting plant health. It's, it's part of uh, these opportunities like today are wonderful to raise awareness in the hemisphere. It's not just the North. There's demand across all of the, the Americas for this kind of information. And the fact that it's well attended shows a strong demand and we will continue to support this as Proceso Norte. And so plant health really, if you want to look at boosting the economy, if you want to look at protecting the environment, if you want to look at fostering food security and really you play such an important role. The, the public doesn't necessarily understand all of it, but really the, the science behind it is fantastic. It's very cool actually. And I'm hoping that moments like this today inspire young leaders, young scientists to, to grow into the field. And congratulations once again, uh, last word to Tim, just to close off, but really uh, I just want to congratulate the whole team on a very wonderful webinar, excellent stuff. Well done. Thank you, John Charles. And again, yeah, thank you, especially, you know, Gloria and Isabel and our translators, uh, a fantastic job. Um, and, you know, yeah, we couldn't have done it uh, without you. And, um, you know, so if you also are looking for collaborations, um, you know, be in touch. Um, there are certain contact informations. And uh, through the Prosa Norte website, you can always uh, contact uh, Sergio, Jose, or myself as well. And uh, we can you know, make those connections for you. Um, so at the point, um, I will uh, wish you all a, a good afternoon and good evening. And um, thanks again for, for attending.